the court had previously taken under advisement the defense request that the um, pool camera not um, show the defendant's um, face. Did I accurately summarize the defense request? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, I have considered that request. I am denying the request given the fact that Mr. Turney's face is all over the media. I don't find any additional harm given the fact that the rest of the camera feeds will be showing his face. So that request is denied. Uh, I did receive a, uh, a motion from the defense regarding uh, uh, requesting preclusion of certain evidence. Uh, counsel, when is it anticipated that that witness would be testifying? So why don't we do this, Council? We'll break for lunch a little early, and then I'll take up that motion. I'll just ask, uh, well, was the, defense, was the state going to refer to that testimony in their opening statement? Okay. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, I'll direct until the court rules that nobody mentioned that witness's testimony. And if I, uh, uh, I'll try to break at about 11.50, send the jury to lunch and then I'll take up that motion. Uh, let's see. Oh, Mr. Imbordino, you'd ask that we conclude uh, at about 345 today. Yes, sir. That should be fine. Thank you. Uh, just if you can remind me, I'll try to keep an eye on the clock. I'll do it. All right. Thank you. I guess it depends on whether the PowerPoint works or not. Um, but, yeah, hopefully not more than 30 minutes or so. Yeah, I think so. We just, we needed a few minutes, Judge, to, the PowerPoint worked yesterday. We're not, it's not working right now. So, we're trying to figure that out. And, Your Honor, the other thing we'll need is a headset for the defendant. Uh, he, my understanding is he's on. Oh, a headset. Headset. Okay. Okay. Angela can take care of that.
Get back to the beginning. Yeah. Let the record reflect that the defendant is now present. Just give me one second. Are we able to go full screen on the PowerPoint? Be seated. We are on the record in State versus Cherney. Let the record show the presence of counsel, the defendant, and the jury. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to see you all back. It seems like quite a while since we've been together, but I'm glad that you were all able to make it back today and in time. So thank you so much for that. Uh, so when we were last together, uh, you were sworn in as jurors at this. T let's see. Uh, have we have you read the charging document already? OK, so at this time, I'm going to ask the clerk to read the charging document to the jury uh, in just a moment. Hold on. Hold on. We just need to get him his uh, listening device. <coughs> All right.
Thank you. Next will be the reading of the preliminary jury instructions. You should all have a copy of the preliminary jury instructions in your notebooks. Please feel free to uh, read them along with me or just to listen as I read them aloud. Are there any jurors who cannot locate a copy of the preliminary jury instructions in their notebooks? Looks like you've all found them. Counsel, you have copies as well? Yes, All right. CR 2020-00181801, State of Arizona versus Michael Turney, preliminary instructions. Importance of jury service. Jury service is an important part of our system of justice with a long and distinguished tradition in American law. From the beginning, American law has viewed the jury system as an effective means of drawing on the collective wisdom, experience, and fact-finding abilities of persons such as yourselves. While it may be an occasional inconvenience or worse, jury service is an important responsibility for you, one which I am sure you will take seriously. Duty of jurors. Ladies and gentlemen, now that you've been sworn, I will briefly tell you something about your duties as jurors and give you some instructions. At the end of the trial, I will give you more detailed instructions, and those instructions will control your deliberations. It will be your duty to decide the facts. You must decide the facts only from the evidence produced in court. You must not speculate or guess about any fact. In deciding this case, you are not to be swayed by mere sentiment conjecture, sympathy, passion, prejudice, public opinion, or public feeling. Race, color, religion, national ancestry, gender, or sexual orientation should not influence you. You will hear the evidence, decide the facts, and then apply the law I will give you to those facts. That is how you will reach your verdict. In doing so, you must follow that law whether you agree with it or not. You must not take anything I may say or do during the trial as indicating any opinion about the facts. You and you alone are the judges of the facts. Evidence. You will decide what the facts are from the evidence presented here in court. That evidence will consist of testimony of witnesses, any documents and other things received into evidence as exhibits, and any evidence stipulated to by the parties or that you are instructed to consider. You will decide the credibility of the witnesses and weight to be given to any evidence presented in the case, whether it is direct evidence or circumstantial evidence. Direct and circumstantial evidence. Evidence may be direct or circumstantial. Direct evidence is a physical exhibit or the testimony of a witness who saw, heard, touched, smelled, or otherwise actually perceived an event. Circumstantial evidence is the proof of a fact or facts from which the existence of another fact may be determined. The law makes no distinction between direct and circumstantial evidence. You must determine the weight to be given to all the evidence without regard to whether it is direct or circumstantial. Stipulations. During the trial, the lawyers are permitted to stipulate that certain evidence exists. This means both sides agree that evidence exists and is to be considered by you during your deliberations at the conclusion of the trial. Evidence, statements of lawyers, and rulings. As I mentioned earlier, it is your job to decide from the evidence what the facts are. Here are six rules on what is and what is not evidence. Number one, evidence to be considered. You must determine the facts only from the testimony of witnesses and from exhibits admitted in evidence. Anything you may see or hear when the court is not in session, even if what you see or hear is done or said by one of the parties or by one of the witnesses, is not evidence and must not be considered by you. If you should hear or see anything pertaining to the case outside the courtroom, or if anyone should attempt to speak to you about this case outside the courtroom, please report to me or my staff as soon as you can. Number two, lawyer statements. Statements or arguments made by the lawyers in the case are not evidence. Their purpose is to help you understand the evidence and law. Number three, questions to a witness. A question is not evidence. A question can only be used to give meaning to a witness's answer. Number four, objections to questions. If a lawyer objects to a question and I do not allow the witness to answer, you must not try to guess what the answer might have been. You must also not try to guess the reason why the lawyer objected in the first place. 
Number five, rejected evidence. At times during the trial, evidence may be offered that I do not admit as evidence. When evidence is not admitted, you must not consider it for any purpose. Number six, stricken evidence. At times I may order some evidence to be stricken from the record. Then it is no longer evidence and you must not consider it for any purpose. Rulings of the court. Admission of evidence in court is governed by rules of law. I will apply those rules and resolve any issues that arise during the trial concerning the admission of evidence. If an objection to a question is sustained, you must disregard the question and you must not guess what the answer to the question might have been. If an exhibit is offered into evidence and an objection to it is sustained, you must not consider that exhibit as evidence. If testimony is ordered stricken from the record, you must not consider that testimony for any purpose. Do not concern yourselves with the reasons for my rulings on the admission of evidence. Do not regard those rulings as any indication from me of the credibility of the witnesses or the weight you should give to any evidence that has been admitted. Exclusion of witnesses. The rule of exclusion of witnesses is in effect and will be observed by all witnesses until the trial is over and a result announced. This means that all witnesses will remain outside the courtroom during the entire trial except when one is called to the witness stand. They will wait in the areas directed by the courtroom assistant uh, unless other arrangements have been made with the attorney who has called them. The rule also forbids witnesses from telling anyone but the lawyers what they will testify about or what they have testified to. If witnesses do talk to the lawyers about their testimony, Other witnesses and jurors should avoid being present or overhearing. The lawyers are directed to inform all their witnesses of these rules and to remind them of their obligations from time to time as may be necessary. The parties and their lawyers should keep a careful lookout to prevent any potential witness from remaining in the courtroom if they accidentally enter. Bench con- oh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, there are some exclusion- there are some exceptions to the rule of exclusion of witnesses. A crime victim's and uh, next of kin to a deceased crime victim is permitted to remain in the courtroom at all times, even if they are going to be a witness in the case. In addition, each side is permitted to designate an investigating officer or a case agent to sit with them and assist them during the trial, even if that person is going to be a witness. So there may be a few uh, people that you will see in the courtroom during the trial that will be testifying, and you should understand that those are exclusion, those are exceptions to the rule of exclusion of witnesses. Bench conferences and recesses. From time to time during the trial, it may become necessary for me to talk with the attorneys out of the hearing of the jury, either by having a conference at the bench when the jury is present in the courtroom or by calling a recess. Please understand that while you are waiting, we are working. The purpose of these conferences is not to keep relevant information from you, but to decide how certain evidence is to be treated under the rules of evidence and to avoid confusion and error. We will, of course, do what we can to keep the number and length of these conferences to a minimum. I may not always grant an attorney's request for a conference. Do not consider my granting or denying a request for a conference as any indication of my opinion of the case or of what your verdict should be. Please do not be concerned with what we are discussing at any bench conference we may have. Please respect the privacy of those participating in the bench conference in order to maintain the fairness of the trial. Credibility of witnesses. In deciding the facts of this case, you should consider what testimony to accept and what to reject. You may accept everything a witness says, or part of it, or none of it. In evaluating testimony, you should use the tests for accuracy and truthfulness that people use in determining matters of importance in everyday life, including such factors as the witness's ability to see or hear or know the things the witness testified to, the quality of the witness's memory, the witness's manner while testifying, whether the witness has any motive, bias, or prejudice, whether the witness is contradicted by anything the witness said or wrote before trial or by other evidence, and the reasonableness of the witness's testimony when considered in the light of the other evidence. Consider all of the evidence in light of reason, common sense, and experience. 
No transcript available to jury taking notes. At the end of the trial, you will have to make your decision based on what you recall of the evidence. You will not be given a written transcript of any testimony. You should pay close attention to the testimony as it is given. You have been provided with notepads and pens. The court encourages you to take notes during the trial if you wish to do so. Do not let note-taking distract you so that you miss hearing or seeing other testimony. You may use your notes during your deliberations at the end of the trial. Until then, keep your notes to yourself. During recesses in the trial, you may leave your notes on your seat. Your notes are confidential and my bailiff will guard them. No one will be allowed to read your notes. Whether you take notes or not, you should rely upon your own memory of what was said and not be overly influenced by the notes of the other jurors. After you have rendered your verdict, the courtroom assistant will collect your notes and destroy them. Do not be influenced at all by my taking notes at times. What I write down may have nothing to do with what you will be concerned with at this trial. Admonition. I'm now going to say a few words about your conduct as jurors. I'm going to give you some do's and don'ts, mostly don'ts, which I will call the admonition. Do wear your juror badge at all times in and around the courthouse so everyone will know you are on a jury. Each of you has gained knowledge and information from the experiences you have had prior to this trial. Once this trial has begun, you are to determine the facts of this case only from the evidence that is presented in this courtroom. Arizona law prohibits a juror from receiving evidence not properly admitted at trial. Therefore, do not do any research or make any investigation about the case, the law, or any subject related to your jury service on your own. Do not view or visit the locations where the events of the case took place. Do not consult any source, such as a newspaper, a dictionary, a reference manual, television, radio, or the Internet for information. If you have a question about the case or about your jury service or need additional information, submit your request in writing and I will discuss it with the attorneys. Do not talk to anyone about the case or about anyone who has anything to do with it, and do not let anyone talk to you about those matters until the trial has ended and you have been discharged as jurors. This prohibition about not discussing the case includes using email, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, instant messaging, smartphones, Google, Yahoo, or any internet search engine, or any other form of electronic communication for any purpose whatsoever if it relates in any way to this case. This includes but is not limited to blogging about the case or your experience as a juror in the, on this case, discussing the evidence, the lawyers, the parties, the court, your deliberations, your reactions to testimony or exhibits, or any aspect of the case until your courtroom experience with, I'm sorry, your reactions to testimony or exhibits or any aspect of the case or your courtroom experience with anyone whatsoever until the trial has ended and you have been discharged as jurors. Until then, you may tell people you are on a jury and you may tell them the estimated schedule for the trial, but do not tell them anything else except to say that you cannot talk about the trial until it is over. One reason for these prohibitions is because the trial process works by each side knowing exactly what evidence is being considered by you and what law you are applying to the facts you find. As I previously told you, the only evidence you are to consider in this matter is that which is introduced in the courtroom. The law that you are to apply is the law that I give you in the final instructions. This prohibits you from consulting any outside source. If you have cell phones, laptops, or other communication devices, please turn them off and do not turn them on while in the courtroom. You may use them only during breaks so long as you do not use them to communicate about any matter having to do with the case. You are not permitted to take notes with laptops, smartphones, audio recorders, or any other electronic device. You are only permitted to take notes on the notepad provided by the court. Devices that can take pictures are prohibited and may not be used for any purpose. It is your duty not to speak with or permit yourselves to be addressed by any person on any subject connected with the trial. If someone should try to talk to you about the case, stop him or her or walk away. 
If you should overhear others talking about the case, stop them or walk away. If anything like this does happen, report it to me or any member of my staff as soon as you can. To avoid even the appearance of improper conduct, do not talk to any of the parties, the lawyers, the witnesses, or media representatives about anything until the case is over, even if your conversation with them has nothing to do with the case. For example, you might pass an attorney in the hall and ask what good restaurants there are downtown, and somebody from a distance may think you are talking about the case. So again, please avoid even the appearance of improper conduct. The lawyers and parties have been given the same instruction about not speaking with you jurors, so do not think they are being unfriendly to you. When you go home tonight and family and friends ask what the case is about, remember, you cannot speak with them about the case. All you can tell them is that you are on a jury, the estimated schedule for the trial, and that you cannot talk about the case until it is over. In a civil case, the jurors are permitted to discuss the evidence during the trial while the trial progresses. In a criminal case such as this, however, the jurors are not permitted to discuss the evidence until all the evidence has been presented and the jurors have retired to deliberate on the verdict. You may not discuss the evidence among yourselves until you retire to deliberate on your verdict. Therefore, during breaks and recesses, whether you are assembled in the jury room or not, you shall not discuss any aspect of the case with each other until the case is submitted to you for your deliberations at the end of the trial. Again, if you have a question or need additional information, submit your request in writing and I will discuss it with the attorneys. During the trial, you are not to engage in any conduct that impairs or interferes with your ability to hear and understand the court proceedings. Do not form final opinions about any fact or about the outcome of the case until you have heard and considered all of the evidence, the closing arguments, and the rest of the instructions I will give you on the law. Keep an open mind during the trial. Form your final opinions only after you have had an opportunity to discuss the case with each other in the jury room at the end of the trial. Please advise me in writing immediately if you believe that any juror has violated any provision of this admonition. Before each recess, I will not repeat the entire admonition I've just given you. I will probably refer to it by saying, please remember the admonition or something like that. However, even if I forget to make any reference to it, remember that the admonition still applies at all times during the trial. Media coverage. There may or may not be news media coverage of the trial. What the news media covers is up to them. If there is media coverage, you must avoid it during the trial. If you do encounter something about this case in the news media during the trial, End your exposure to it immediately and report to me as soon as you can. If there are cameras in the courtroom during the trial, do not be concerned about them. Court rules require that the proceedings be photographed or televised in such a way that no juror can be recognized. Questions by jurors. If at any time during the trial you have difficulty hearing or seeing something that you should be hearing or seeing, or if you get into personal distress for any reason, raise your hand and let me know. If you have any questions about parking, restaurants, or other matters relating to jury service, feel free to ask one of the court staff. But remember that the admonition applies to court staff as it does to everyone else, so do not try to discuss the case with court staff. If you have a question about the case for a witness or for me, write it down, but do not sign it. Hand the question to the courtroom assistant. If your question is for a witness who is about to leave the witness stand, please signal the courtroom assistant or me before the witness leaves the stand. So, ladies and gentlemen, the way that this works is that when a witness is called to the witness stand, the party that calls that witness will do a direct examination, the opposing side will do a cross-examination, and then the party that called the witness will do a redirect examination. When that is finished, I will turn to you and ask if any members of the jury have any questions for that witness. That will be your one and only opportunity to ask a question of that witness. If you don't have any questions, the witness will be excused and will not be back uh, again. So you will not get a second opportunity 
If you do have a question for the witness, take the opportunity to ask your question. Remember that the question has to be in writing. If you have a question in your mind but not written down, just signal to me when I ask that you have a question. I'll give you whatever time that you need to write down the question. It's okay to put multiple questions on a single page. If you can just number them for me, that helps me to keep track. Um, uh, and so, uh, again, you'll signal to me that, yes, you do have a question. When it's finished, uh, the courtroom assistant will get it from you and will bring it to me. The lawyers and I will discuss the question. The rules of evidence or other rules of law may prevent some questions from being asked. If the rules permit the question and the answer is available, an answer will be given at the earliest opportunity. When we do not ask a question, it is no reflection on the person submitting it. You should attach no significance to the failure to ask a question. I will apply the same legal standards to your questions as I do to the questions asked by the lawyers. If a particular question is not asked, please do not guess why or what the answer might have been. Alternate jurors. The law provides for a jury of eight persons in a case such as this. We have more than eight jurors so that if a juror becomes ill or has a personal emergency, the trial can continue without that juror. At the end of the case, alternate jurors will be determined by lot in a drawing held in open court. Please do not be concerned with, what, with who may or may not be chosen as an alternate at the end of the case constitutional right not to testify. A defendant in a criminal case has a constitutional right to not testify at trial, and the exercise of that right cannot be considered by the jury in determining whether a defendant is guilty or not guilty. Statements of the defendant. If there is testimony in this case about what a defendant said to a law enforcement officer, you must not consider any such statements unless you determine beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant made the statements voluntarily. A defendant's statement to a law enforcement officer was not voluntary if it resulted from the defendant's will being overcome by a law enforcement officer's use of any sort of violence, coercion, or threats, or by any direct or implied promise, however slight. You must give such weight to the defendant's statement as you feel it deserves under all the circumstances. Presumption of innocence and burden of proof. The state has charged the defendant with a crime. The charge is not evidence against the defendant. You must not think the defendant is guilty just because the defendant has been charged with a crime. The defendant has pled not guilty. The defendant's plea of not guilty means that the state must prove every part of each charge beyond a reasonable doubt. The law does not require a defendant to prove innocence. Every defendant is presumed by law to be innocent. The state has the burden of proving the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. In civil cases, it is only necessary to prove that a fact is more likely true than not or that its truth is highly probable. In criminal cases such as this, the state's proof must be more powerful than that. It must be beyond a reasonable doubt. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt is proof that leaves you firmly convinced of the defendant's guilt. There are very few things in this world that we know with absolute certainty, and in criminal cases, the law does not require proof that overcomes every doubt. If based on your consideration of the evidence, you are firmly convinced that the defendant is guilty of the crime charged, you must find him guilty. If, on the other hand, you think there is a real possibility that he is not guilty, you must give him the benefit of the doubt and find him not guilty. In deciding whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty, do not consider the possible punishment. The charged offense. To assist you in considering the evidence that will be presented during the trial, I will now tell you about the crime with which the defendant is charged. The defendant is charged with one count of second-degree murder. The crime of second-degree murder requires proof of one of the following. Number one, the defendant intentionally caused the death of another person. Or, number two, the defendant caused the death of another person by conduct which the defendant knew would cause death or serious physical injury. Or, number three, under circumstances manifesting extreme indifference to human life, the defendant recklessly engaged in conduct that created a grave risk of death 
and thereby caused the death of another person. The risk must be such that disregarding it was a gross deviation from what a reasonable person in the defendant's situation would have done. The defendant has pled not guilty to the charge. The state must prove each element of the charged crime beyond a reasonable doubt. I will give you more details and definitions about the alleged crime in the final jury instructions. Scheduling during trial. The trial is expected to last through Thursday, July 20, 2023. We will all do our best to move the case along, but delays frequently occur. These won't be anyone's fault, so don't hold them against the parties. Delays usually occur because the attorneys and I often need to resolve certain legal matters before these matters may be presented to you in court or because I am busy with matters in other cases. The usual hours of trial will be from 10.30 a.m. to 4.45 p.m. We will take short recesses about every mid-morning and mid-afternoon and occasionally stretch breaks in place. We will recess at 12 noon and begin again at 1.30 p.m., Unless a different starting time is announced prior to recessing for the evening, you may assume a starting time of 10.30 a.m. for the next day. At the beginning of the day, please assemble in the jury room for this division. Please do not come back into the courtroom until you are called by the courtroom assistant. Order of trial. Criminal trials generally proceed in the following order. First, the prosecuting attorney will make an opening statement giving a preview of the case, the defendant's attorney may make an opening statement immediately after the prosecutor's statement, or it may be postponed until after the state's case has been presented. What is said in opening statements is not evidence, nor is it an argument. The purpose of an opening statement is to help you prepare for anticipated evidence. Second, the state will present its evidence. After the state finishes the presentation of its evidence, the defendant may present evidence. If the defendant does produce evidence, the state may present additional or rebuttal evidence. With each witness, there is a direct examination, a cross-examination by the opposing side, and finally, redirect examination. This usually ends the testimony of that witness. Third, after all the evidence is in, I will read and give you copies of the final instructions, the rules of law you must follow in reaching your verdict. Fourth, the attorneys will make closing arguments to tell you what they think the evidence shows and how they think you should decide the case. The state has the right to open and close the argument since the state has the burden of proof. Just as in opening statements, what is said in closing arguments is not evidence. Fifth, you will deliberate in the jury room about the evidence and rules of law in an effort to reach the verdict. If you unanimously agree upon the verdict, it will be read in court with you and the parties present. Sixth, in some circumstances, it may be necessary for you to make additional findings. If this is the case, I will give you further instructions at that time. Finally, you will be discharged and released from the admonition. The rules of law I've shared with you in the past few minutes are preliminary only. At the end of the case, I will read to you and give you a copy of the final instructions of law. In deciding this case, you must be guided by the final instructions. At this time, the state may proceed with its opening statement. Counsel, whenever you are ready, it looks like your computer may have uh, gone to sleep. Remember the other day, well, welcome back. Thank you for your kind attention. Uh, the other day when we were here, I think I told you that sometimes I tend to be soft-spoken. So I'm going to speak into this microphone. Feel free to raise your hand at any time if you can't hear me. Same for anyone. Uh, if you didn't hear one of us ask a question, feel free to let us know. Just a couple of preliminary matters. 
a couple of them were covered by Judge Myers. First of all, this opening statement is meant, <clears throat> I will attempt to give you an outline of what I expect the state's evidence to be. I won't discuss every witness. I won't discuss in this opening statement every thing that I think they will say. The um, purpose is just to give you some expectation of what you will hear. In just a, a minute or two, I'm going to begin talking to you about a list attorney, try to give you a, some sense of who she was, what her life was like, who her family was, uh, those kinds of things. Another thing I want to let you know is that occasionally you may hear a party request, to, the state request to put a witness on out of order. In other words, they may have testimony about an issue that actually somebody else has already talked about. And you might be wondering, well, why, are they, why weren't they called first? Well, witnesses have lives just like you do. So we, we attempt to uh, make life a little easier for them to get here, not interfere with their work schedules as best we can, those kinds of things. <clears throat> Third, <coughs> as you will hear, <coughs> as you will hear in just a moment, <coughs> there will be people testifying in this case <coughs> about events that happened in the late 1990s, early 2000 and 2001. So, for some of those folks, <coughs> we're asking for their memory of events that occurred some 20 to 25 years. I, I'm telling you this because what may happen with an individual witness, <clears throat> they may not recall something that they said 20 years ago. So occasionally you'll, you, you will see, may see, that witness presented with a, a copy of a police report documenting an interview they did those 20-something years ago. It may refresh their memory, it may not, but that's, that's a process that you will see take place, uh, I expect, in this trial as it does in, in many other trials. All right, State of Arizona versus the defendant Michael Turney. You'll discover throughout this trial that I'm not the world's greatest at electronics. So let me see if I can. Well, I may just have to do it by hand. <clears throat> this was Elissa Turney. Elissa Turney has not been seen alive since May 17th of 2001. The evidence will establish that despite efforts to locate her in all these years, <clears throat> her body has never been found. Her father was, her stepfather was the defendant. You will hear testimony about her family. There were, her younger sister, his name is Sarah. Sarah will be testifying in this case. She had <clears throat> brothers, James, John, Rhett, and Michael. Some of those brothers were stepbrothers, if you will. Uh, John and Alyssa had the same mother. Their mother, their mother married the defendant. <clears throat> the defendant had sons. Rhett, James, and Michael. So these families joined together. They lived in various locations, but at the time 
that Alyssa was murdered. They were living at 17217 North 34th Street here in Phoenix, Arizona, Maricopa County. <clears throat> Alyssa was, I believe the, the witnesses you will hear from are her, many of her friends, her family members, including her brothers and her sister. I expect that <clears throat> the, the testimony will, will establish that Alyssa was pretty much a typical teenager. She was 17 years of age, had just turned 17 very recently prior to her disappearance. She went to school. She had a boyfriend. She had a part-time job. What you will learn, I expect with the testimony, is that the relationship she had with this defendant was oftentimes troubled. Oftentimes there were conflicts between the two of them. You will hear testimony about that. You will see some documents that give you a, a real sense of what um, this relationship, this troubled relationship was. Alyssa will, <clears throat> as I said, she had many girlfriends. She had a boyfriend. She had a part-time job at Jack in the Box. She had a savings account. She knew how to drive, but she did not have a driver's license. And at the time of her disappearance, she did not own a car. Perhaps the best historian for Alyssa will be her younger sister, Sarah. Sarah was, and uh, I hope Sarah does, I believe, she, I can't remember if she was 12 or 13 years old at the time that uh, Alyssa disappeared. I think Sarah will describe to you maybe what many of you have observed, a, a, a typical uh, sister relationship. Not always the greatest, uh, they had their issues, but they loved one another. <clears throat> I believe Sarah will tell you when she testifies that as she looks back on this relationship, um, it's clear to her that she did not appreciate the relationship uh, as much as she does now, as it was taking place then. Alyssa will be described to you as friendly, outgoing, made friends easy, easily, um, tried hard to do well at school. Just a typical teenager. What you, will, what you will discover through the testimony is that this defendant, uh, for whatever his reasons were, attempted to, to basically control every part of her life, every day of her life, whether she was at home, whether she was at school, whether she was at work. That control certainly her younger sister, Sarah, as her parent, you would expect for both of them to exercise parental control. This was, you will discover from the testimony, above the norm. And he treated them differently. He treated them differently, you will discover from the evidence. He you will hear references that this defendant made about Alyssa, derogatory comments that he made about her, 
attempting to portray her as dumb, um, as having mental health issues, um, things like that. This, <clears throat> this case began May 17th. Well, obviously it began many years before this, but the investigation into her disappearance began on May 17th, 2001. I think, as I said a minute ago, she had just recently turned 17. This was the end of the very last day of her junior year in high school. I believe the evidence will be that since it was the last day, the last class day, that it was not going to be the, the typical hours. In other words, she would not have been, school would not have, would not have been over later in the day as it normally was. But she went to school. Sarah went to school. They went to different schools. Sarah was younger. Sometimes they walked. Sometimes they rode. Sarah rode a bus. Sometimes the defendant would take them to school. It just depended. And speaking about the, the control that this defendant exercised over really everyone at some stage of their lives, of his children, he <clears throat> recorded phone calls, incoming and outgoing phone calls from the house. At the time of Alyssa's disappearance, there was a surveillance camera in the, the carport, and I'll show you a photograph of this house in just a moment, <clears throat> but let me just give you a little background. There was a surveillance camera in the carport that um, showed the carport and the, the uh, kitchen door entrance to the carport. There was another surveillance camera in a vent in the living room. And, and I'll show you some clips of, of a couple of those videos. That surveillance camera was focused on a couch, a sofa, in, the, in that living room at the time. Sarah will tell you that there was sometimes the defendant would set up a camcorder uh, in, in uh, different parts of the house. You'll hear testimony that the defendant not only recorded phone calls, but sometimes recorded uh, conversations with people with a tape recorder. The evidence you will hear is that on that May 17, 2001, approximately, well, sometime before noon, shortly before noon, the defendant came to Alyssa's school and picked her up and took her out early. You'll hear testimony from her, the boyfriend that she had at the time, Mr. Lackman, that Alyssa stopped by and told him, I'm leaving, my dad is pi just picking me up. That's the last time that John Lackman ever saw Alyssa. You'll hear testimony that a young man uh, that knew her was graduating, was a senior in high school, and was graduating uh, later that day. He was expecting her to come to his graduation. She never showed up. She had, as I told you, a part-time job at Jack in the Box. She never showed up again. All we know about what happened the rest of that day as, as it relates to Alyssa's disappearance is what Sarah will tell you that she observed and what the defendant has told people over the years. You will not. So <clears throat> later that day on May 17th, the defendant called the Phoenix Police Department and filed a what was referred to as a runaway report, claiming that uh, she had run away from home. 
he was supposed to pick up Sarah from school. Sarah's uh, went to a, since it was her last day of school as well, they had a, an outing that they went to. He was supposed to pick her up at school. Uh, he did not appear. Uh, she went to a friend's house, which was not unusual, she will tell you, for her to walk to that friend's house. It wasn't very far away from the school. The defendant had picked her up there on other occasions, and that's what happened this time. He did not pick her up at school. He picked her up at her friend's house. The evidence will not tell you exactly what time this was, but it was late in the afternoon of May 17th. Sarah will tell you that the defendant told her, I can't get hold of Alyssa. I've been calling her. Alyssa had a cell phone. She's not answering. They got to the house. Sarah will tell you that uh, she went into Alyssa's bedroom. Alyssa was not there. There was... Uh, Sarah will tell you that she found a, a handwritten note that, uh, and there's no dispute that it's in Alyssa's handwriting. Uh, there will be no evidence telling you when it was written, under what circumstances it was written, but it, the note said that she was going to California, uh, that she had taken $300, and that <clears throat> she was going to California because uh, that's what her father and Sarah wanted her to do. Sarah will tell you that Alyssa normally carried a, a backpack. That was not there. But what Sarah will also tell you is that on the floor of that bedroom, the contents, uh, well, what appeared to be, the, had been the contents of that backpack, school materials, books, et cetera, were, were dumped on the floor. She didn't observe, Sarah did not observe like the closet cleaned out, like somebody might pack a suitcase and take their clothes with them. Her, her uh, makeup was still there. Her cell phone was still there. There was a necklace still there that you will discover had been a gift from Mr. Lackman. You'll hear evidence that the defendant called various people to try to find out where Alyssa was. When he called the police, he said he discovered, he, he told the police uh, on the phone that he discovered her missing around 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Unfortunately, you will discover, uh, the Phoenix Police Department receives hundreds sometimes thousands of these types of runaway reports. So they did not go to the house to investigate. They did not go to the house to interview Sarah or the defendant. Unfortunately, you will discover they took him at his word that she had run away. He later advised the Phoenix Police Department that he received a phone call from California. And depending on who he w talked to, he either knew it was Alyssa, thought it was Alyssa, presumed it was Alyssa. She yelled at him. Um, but there's no recording of that phone call. Over the next few years, again, the Phoenix Police Department did not really investigate this case. Other than, if, for example, an unidentified body was discovered in Arizona or California or Texas, uh, they did manage to get uh, a DNA profile. They, they obtained dental records. Uh, from the defendant 
And whenever such uh, an alert came through, attempts to compare to see if this was Alyssa were done. None of them have ever been Alyssa. Her, rot, her final resting place is unknown. Eventually, in approximately 2008, you will hear from two Phoenix detectives who worked missing persons cases, William Anderson, Stuart Summershoe. Detective Summershoe is retired now. Uh, they began working on the case. Eventually, a search warrant was authored, authorized, and a search took place. But what had happened was, in the years that had passed, the defendant and Sarah were no, no longer living at the same address where Alyssa was last <coughs> living. So a search was conducted of the current residence, and, and I'll tell you about some of the things that were found in the defendant's possession in that house. They also searched the house where Alyssa was living when she went missing. Somebody else was already living there, but they searched it. You will see some photographs of that home. They were taken in about 2008, so they, they, they show the general layout of the home. The furniture that you will see in these photographs is not uh, the defendant's furniture because somebody else was living. There will be no blood evidence. There will be no DNA evidence. The police never found a crime scene, as you might have hoped they would. Let's talk about that search of the defendant's home in 2008. What they discovered was that the defendant had literally hundreds of audio tapes of phone calls that had been recorded over the years. And I don't remember the exact number. Detective Summershoe and or Detective Anderson will be able to tell you that. Literally tubs of cassette tapes, tubs of VHS tapes. This surveillance system used a VHS recorder. They found VHS tapes from years ago, years prior to when Alyssa went missing. Recorded phone calls years before uh, Alyssa went missing. There was no recording of the day that Alyssa went missing. And as I told you earlier, no recording of that phone call. And, and there was a phone call to, to the residence. The defendant himself was able to obtain a record of, from, the, from the phone company. There was a phone call, as he described, from California. Obviously, the record doesn't tell you who called. You will hear that it came from a payphone, but there is no recording of that call. Sarah will tell you that all calls were recorded. There, this recorder was in the kitchen. She will tell you that there were always stacks of cassette tapes there in order to recall, to, to record calls. But not this one from California.
Let's see. This is a photograph of Sarah, uh, Alyssa, and two of their brothers, Mike and John. If I could make this work properly, you would. This this is actually a, a video showing uh, Alyssa and Sarah with this young child and the dog. I <clears throat> I had hoped to play it for you just so that um, you'd get a sense. That was Alyssa, and that was pretty much the way Alyssa was all the time. Fun, outgoing, friendly. This is the home that they were living in. Now, again, as a reminder, these photographs were taken some seven years after Alyssa went missing. As you can see, the um, carport there's a front door. Sarah will tell you they didn't use the front door. And the videos that I'm gonna show you in a minute will reflect that. <laughs> Notice in this carport there is a, there's, first of all, there's a storage door. But there's also the door to the far left, as you're looking at this photograph, <clears throat> went into the kitchen. And that's the door that they used to ex enter and exit the home, as opposed to the front door. And that surveillance camera is in this, was in this carport. Now obviously when police took these photographs some seven years later, the cameras were lo no longer in the house. This is the kitchen, and this particular photograph shows you a view, the testimony will be from the kitchen looking down this hallway. Uh, which is where the bedrooms were located. Again, a reminder, the, the pictures on the wall, the furniture that you see uh, belonged to somebody else who was living in this home when these photographs were taken. This is a photograph of Alyssa with a couple of her girlfriends from school. This is a picture of uh, Alyssa's boyfriend, Mr. Lackman. You will notice that necklace around her neck. Uh, he, had give, he had given that to her as a, I believe as a birthday present. This photograph <clears throat> is related to the prom, high school prom. That necklace around her neck was found in the bedroom along with her cell phone. Now remember I told you that you will hear evidence that there was a troubled relationship between Alyssa and the defendant. And one, one prime example of that is when police searched the house, the defendant's house in 2008, they found this particular document. I've entitled it the contract. And it's probably going to be difficult. You'll see the original at some point on a screen, maybe a little bit easier to read. But when you read this contract, you will note that it is obvious the defendant was having Alyssa swear to uh, claim that things that she apparently had been saying about him weren't true. As I told you, statements were made by the defendant at various times to various people. So one of the things that happened was, <clears throat> for whatever reason, uh, ABC News 
decided to do a, a show about Alyssa. And it was called uh, Primetime then. Mr. Kionis was the moderator when, when you, uh, you'll see his, his picture here in just a moment. I've taken a couple of clips from this. This was broadcast nationally. Sarah watched it when it was broadcast. Detective Anderson and Detective Summershoe watched it uh, when it was broadcast. Now keep in mind, the defendant is doing an interview with John Kionis. What you will hear is that on a number of occasions, either Detective Anderson and or Detective Summershoe asked the defendant to talk to them, to come down to the police station for an interview so they could, you know, find out more information to help them find Alyssa. And he declined to do so. audio tapes and video tapes. Why did you record so much? Why do I record so much? Videos are recorded because I love my family. But weren't these surveillance cameras in the house? They just was not protecting my home. Have you ever seen so my for usual security? Use? Yeah, mostly for security. Mm -hmm. Why, because I want to spy on everybody? <laughs> Why didn't you hang on to those things that could have proven that you're not to blame? The surveillance video from the day Alyssa disappeared. The audio recording of that phone call you there said There was nothing on the tape. They were told that. What the uh, defendant is referring to there is he has made statements that he watched the video tape from that day, May 17th, 2001, and there was nothing on it. In other words, nothing what? Showing her going to school? One of the statements that you'll hear the defendant made was that <clears throat> when he picked Alyssa up from school early that day, that May 17th, they went and got something to eat. They then went back to the house. They got into an argument. He left. And then when he and Sarah came back, uh, Alyssa was gone. The defendant has said, I watched that video and there was nothing on it. Did you ever do any kind of self-harm against your family? No. Why would I do that? They have no proof whatsoever, anything. I didn't do anything to them or anything like that. If they have no proof, that doesn't mean that you didn't do it. <laughs> Objection, well, Your Honor. May we approach? Again, there's only two people uh, that can confirm. Not at this one time. Is, one is me and the other is Alyssa. <laughs> Alyssa is not here and I'm sitting here. And all I can say is I'm sorry for your loss. So questions, uh, John Kamis asked a question about things that may have happened that there's no evidence in this case. You will hear no evidence that this defendant um, did anything to Alyssa. The evidence is that apparently he has alleged that Alyssa claimed that he did, thus the contract. When you look at the contract, as I told you, he lists a number of things for her to say, this never happened. Now remember I told you that the surveillance camera uh, looked at the carport and a couch. This particular, let me just give you a little preview here. So on this particular day, Mr. Lackman and, and uh, Alyssa were, they go into the home. Apparently there's an argument that takes place. I believe what Mr. Lackman will tell you is that the defendant told him that Alyssa was cheating on him, that she was seeing other guys. Um, an argument ensued. He leaves, you're gonna hear, hear some squealing tires, that's his vehicle leaving. You're gonna see Alyssa come out you're going to see her throw her cell phone down in apparent anger. You're going to see her come back out, um, 
pick up the cell phone and start putting it back together. This particular uh, video, there were two copies found uh, during that search warrant. One is written on the outside of the, the pack, you know, the, the typical cover that covers a VHS tape, and May 1st. Another one says May 6th. We, you will not hear evidence as to, we don't know what, for certain, the date that it occurred, this argument, but it occurred prior uh, at least several days prior to Alyssa being reported as a runaway. This next video focuses on the couch. Uh, Alyssa is, uh, I don't know whether, the, whether people use the term making out. You know, I, I don't know that you can tell for sure what they were doing, but they're on the couch. A young man named Mike Stanley. Um, and again, these are just clips that I put together for the PowerPoint. The, um, so what will happen is you'll see them on the couch. And then in a minute or two, you will see them leaving. It's obvious you will see from the tape that it's nighttime. And again, they're leaving through the carport, not the front door, but the door into the kitchen. Now, remember I told you a little earlier that when police searched the, the residence in 2008, they found literally copies of hundreds of phone calls that had been made over the years. 
you'll hear about some others of those, but this particular one is rather innocuous. It's apparent uh, the defendant called <clears throat> a, um, a workers union and this, you'll hear from this, this is just a very small snippet. It's like you call in on that day to see what jobs are available for union members. But what's interesting about this is the date of this recording. Nineteen ninety-one. A recorded conversation. <clears throat> I believe that I've fairly summarized the evidence in this case. <clears throat> The defendant took Alyssa out of school early. And you'll hear the evidence you'll hear is that he didn't tell, he, he, he told the police, but he didn't tell any of his family members right away that he did. His words are that they got into an argument at the house. <clears throat> There's no <clears throat> video recording of them in the house that day. There's no video recording of them having an argument. There's no video recording of her leaving with her backpack. There's nothing from that day. No recording. There's no recording of that phone call, despite the defendant preserving years, literally years, of phone call recordings, literally years of surveillance camera footage. But no Alyssa. This defendant was the last person to see her alive. He murdered her. We expect at the conclusion of this case, <clears throat> you will find beyond a reasonable doubt the defendant is guilty of the crime charged. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Imordino. Ladies and gentlemen, we're pretty close to the lunch hour, so uh, we'll go ahead and break for lunch. I'll ask you to be back in the jury room no later than 1.30 so we can get an on-time start for the afternoon. You can leave uh, your notebook and anything else you'd like uh, on your seat. Uh, and please remember the admonition. Jury is now excused. Please be seated. Let the record show the presence of counsel and the defendant. The jury is not present. Mr. Jackson, you had an objection. I'll be happy to hear it at this time. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, we're objecting and asking for a mistrial. This is evidence that was precluded. The state, um, we filed motions in limine on molest stuff being asked. They said they weren't going to ask that. And then they brought in a hearsay question um, from Kiaras. We had talked to the state about that in other interviews and were explicitly said that before they brought any of that in front of the jury, we would get a ruling from the judge. This is in violation of the rulings from yourself and Judge Ryan Tuhill who ruled that these, that molest does not come in in this trial. They brought it up and they played that in front of the jury and it's inflammatory and it's prejudicial and the bell can't be unrung. 
just so that I can know exactly which rulings you're referring to. Uh, you're referring to a ruling from Judge Tuhill and from me? Yes, in our motions in limine with Jessica Case, Charity Robinson, and John Lackman. Do you have a date of that ruling? I do not. It was the last time we were here. They stipulated to it. They didn't. They stipulated in their response that they would not ask them questions about molest. Then we specifically had questions about other molest stuff and, and to believe that is 404B material that they have not noticed properly and they're trying to bring it in back door, which is inappropriate. Anything else? No. Any response? Well, first of all, the contract is coming into evidence that's been ruled and that contract, Alyssa is, is avowing that you never molested me. So this question was not a hearsay statement made by any of these witnesses who we are not going to ask. It was a question asked of the defendant. <clears throat> They've had a copy of this broadcast, excuse me, for several years. The other day I specifically sent them um, the, the, redact the minutes into the broadcast that I intended to play on my PowerPoint. If you have... Let me know if you have a problem. I never heard back. I never so saw the clip. We're not contending, as I told this, this jury, that <clears throat> there won't be any evidence that he did these things. But this, these claims were obviously part of the, the nature of the bad relationship between the defendant and Alyssa. So, anyway, that, that's what, why we believe it's relevant. And was not precluded. All right, and, and Mr. Jackson, I will give you the last word, but uh, just to be clear, the, uh, the portion that you're objecting to is the video clip in which he's asked something like, did you ever molest Alyssa? And he says no. Yes, because he is, the narrator in this position was asking questions about hearsay that was precluded from this case. The state knew that. They never sent us that clip and said that this was the clip there. You know, so, so I object to him saying that they sent us the clip. They said that they would send us, and they were playing part of one clip, and they never sent that to us. So I, I disagree that, that that was something that was given. It was given to us as we were walking over at about 10.25 this morning. Um, as for the statement itself, the statement from the question is hearsay. Therefore, double hearsay exception in the sense that the narrator is using hearsay to ask Mr. Turney a question. That topic is 404B. If they intended to get in it, the state must notice and use that prior bad act. They're trying to imply to the jury that he molested her through questions that they know that they previously were precluded from asking. And therefore, it is inappropriate. All right, I'll, I'll take a look at the uh, previous rulings. I'll get your ruling after lunch. Uh, and I'll just add also, just briefly, I apologize, Your Honor, that we had this exact discussion in a phone conversation last night um, with Mr. Bailey when he called me about other interviews that are coming in, and we had given them redacted dates. They originally did not object to that uh, as a conversation with Mr. Bailey last night. He did tell me that they were going to ask about some of that stuff, but they would get a ruling from the court prior to doing so. All right. And that obviously wasn't done. All right. In regard to defendant's motion to preclude improperly noticed and excessively prejudicial prior bad acts evidence, I have considered the motion and the response. If a reply was filed, I haven't seen it. Judge, there was no reply filed. Okay. Um, so... It seems as though the parties disagree about what the witness would be testifying to. Um, so, uh, Mr. Imbordino, are you going to uh, take this for the state or is Mr. Bailey? Mr. Bailey. Let's get the microphone over to him then. So, Mr. Bailey, in regard to the witness, um, you, you indicate on page two towards the bottom of your response uh, that the witness would uh, or has stated that she personally saw the defendant take Alyssa into a room and then heard some noises. Um, I apologize, Your Honor. We, we're switching to the Masterson uh, preclusion. 
Is that what we're talking about? Yes. Now? Okay. Thank you, Judge. Yes. Um, and so as to that incident where she personally saw the defendant take Alyssa into a room and then heard pounding and yelling, Mr. Jack, uh, Ms. Hicks, uh, do you disagree that that's what the witness would be saying? Judge, not to the first point. We don't disagree that that's what she would testify to. Defense's, um, defense's objection is that this, again, is unnoticed 404B evidence. Um, we didn't find out, first of all, that the state was intending to call Ms. Masterson until a couple of weeks before trial, after a journey had been impaneled. Um, and we had no idea that they were intending to elicit this other act's evidence. There are rules that are required if the state intends to elicit other acts evidence, and that I, was not I done. I get that, but but I I'm skipping a step for a moment and trying to figure out what the witness would be testifying to. So, do you disagree that that's a statement that the witness has made? Uh, no, Your Honor. Defense does not uh, disagree that that is a statement that the witness made. Defense does disagree with um, some of the witnesses. I guess, characterization of what she heard in that room. The witness said that she heard sounds of violence. Um, defense would object to any testimony related to her interpretation of, of what she heard. Obviously, loud noises, yelling, that's different than sounds of violence. That's an interpretation of something that she wasn't physically there to witness. She wasn't in the room. Okay, but you don't disagree that she would testify that she saw him take her into a room and then heard pounding and yelling? No, that's something that she has said. Okay. And uh, do we have a time frame as to when this incident was? I cannot recall off the top of my head uh, when that time frame was, Your Honor. Like, do we think it was within six months, two years? I would, I would, I would want to refer to the recording that we did with Ms. Masterson to shore that up, Judge. I, okay. I can tell you. The second portion, I have a better recollection of when that occurred, and that was closer to when Alyssa was around 13. Okay. That's the incident where uh, the witness would testify that... Uh, About slapping. Hold on. Uh, right. Oh. I'm assuming if you're saying that the chronology or the time is relevant to whether you want this to come in. I'm attempting to assist defense in a way, I guess, and let you know that the slapping incident occurred years prior. The pounding incident, I would need to, to refer to the recording because I don't want to make a misstatement as to what that was. Do you agree that all three of the incidents, so the taking into a room and hearing pounding and yelling, that's one incident. Second one, uh, was the slap, and third incident was defendant shoving Alyssa against a wall uh, and held her there for flirting with a boy. Is the time frame for all three of those um, when she was about 13? My recollection is the slap and the flirting um, were years prior. The pounding is a different incident that she told us during an interview that we did in mid-May. Um, and I would need to refer, again, to that recording to give you a better idea, Judge. Okay. So I'm going to grant the defense motion to preclude the two incidents that the, where the time frame is when she was about 13. I find that the, uh, the relevance as to the state of their relationship when Alyssa disappeared is, is too remote. So I'm granting the motion as to that. As to the third incident, during the lunch hour, why don't you try and clarify what that time frame was, and we'll talk about it uh, after and, lunch. And, Your Honor, the third incident, are we referring to the push? The third, my understanding, Judge, is from what you just said, the, the remaining incident that we will decide is the incident where she uh, observed the defendant take Alyssa into the bedroom, heard pounding and yelling. That's the third incident. Because defense, during the defense interview, Ms. Masterson stated that she couldn't recall exactly when any of these incidents happened, but she guessed it happened sometime in her preteen or teen years. So that's a very large gap of time. 
I don't think there was ever a certain date or time that was given from Ms. Masterson just based off of the defense interview. Okay. Well, I'll ask the prosecution to see if they can't clarify the time frame, and then we can take it up after lunch. Uh, anything else that we can address before we break for lunch from the state? No, Your Honor. Thank you. From the defense. Uh, is the defense going to make an opening statement now, or are you going to wait until the close of state's evidence? I will make one at 1.30. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, we're, uh, we're at recess till 1.30. Okay. Thank you. I wouldn't have felt bad anyway. No, <laughs> 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 Walk back without me, and then I'll meet you there if you want. Whatever you need. Yeah, I don't know. 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 Yeah, I don't know.
pick up the recording. And it would, it would record these calls until that tape ran out. And you'll hear from Detective Anderson and Detective Summershoe, who went through a lot of these tapes, that a lot of these calls just ended abruptly. They were being recorded, and then they stopped, because the technology isn't the same as today, where you could just have it recording forever on a digital space. That was the same thing with the video. The video recorder will be this system that had two cameras set up. One was in the carport, looking out towards the front door, or the door that they use as the front door, the carport door, and out onto the main street. The other one had a view from the vent out through, and you could catch the Arcadia door coming in and the couch where you saw in that video. And you will learn the same thing, and you will hear Sarah talk about it, um, that this system was always playing. You could see the recordings. You could go into the room and look at the monitor and see what the, the video camera was showing, but it always didn't record. It wasn't recording 24 hours a day because it required these eight-hour VHS tapes. And so you would have to set it. You would have to actually set the recording for that to work. So it always didn't capture every single thing that happened 24 hours a day. Now, you will learn that when that call came in, Michael immediately recognized that voice as Alyssa's. The call was very brief. Michael may be thinking that she was around. He got up, went outside. He was looking, driving around, looking for, looking at different pay phones, different things in the area that maybe she called from. You will learn that he used to be a police officer in the 70s, worked for Maricopa County Sheriff's Office. Some of his training was that when, when this happened, maybe people are close in proximity when they make a call like this. So that's why he thought maybe she was around, and that's why he took off and went out. You will learn that he immediately um, told Sarah and her friend Shay about this call. They were Shay a friend of Alyssa's was staying with them um, because Michael was, you'll hear he was going around doing a lot of things and Sarah was 12 years old. So Shay was in and out of the house helping watch and stay with him while um, he was looking for Alyssa. You will learn that he did everything in his power to try to get that call from Quest. He called them, he was on the phone with customer service. He did everything to get that call and they told him he could not do it without a subpoena. So he contacted Phoenix Police Department ask them to intervene. They were not willing or couldn't, or weren't able to help. He then spoke with the sergeant. He then spoke with someone else. Nobody would help him get this call. So he didn't let it lie. You're gonna learn that what he did was, he then used some of his own money. He sued Quest to try to get this number. He filed a lawsuit, got the number. It took about, you'll learn it took about six weeks. He got this, someone at the end of June, beginning of July, he got this phone number. It had a California number on it, and you'll learn that he kept calling that number, and someone finally answered. He was able to find out where that location was, and he went out to that location on several occasions. He went out to California to look for her on several different occasions. You will learn that as this case progressed, Michael was the only one that was pushing this case when it started in 2000. 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006. He was pressuring PPD. He was calling sergeants. He was calling, writing letters to chief of police. He called the FBI. He called his congressman. He was calling all sorts of people to try to get attention to this case. And no one would investigate. He was putting in his time and his money searching for Alyssa. He even contacted the National uh, Children's National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. This is a group that PPD sometimes or other, they recommend to families because they are a national organization that can get the word out a little bit better. So you will hear that he contacted them over the years and tried to get her name out there, trying to put information into this. He even helped work with them to get um, a hood, a picture of, Alyssa's face on a NASCAR hood. That was something that they were doing back then. They would put these missing children on the top of one of the racers' car to get exposure. And he got Alyssa's picture on the top of one of the race cars in a race. He was doing all of this, and nobody would help him. You will hear that Detective Schoenfelder was assigned the case a few days after, and he essentially treated this as a runaway. 
didn't want to listen. He didn't want to take any information. He would, he would get information. There's not a lot of reports. Detective Schoenfelder did not keep a lot of records um, of his interactions with anyone at that time, but he did keep some of the documents that he, re that he got from, from Mr. Turney over the year or so that he was investigating, but he never followed up on any of them. Then fast forward to about 2003 to 2004, Detective Murphy became assigned the case. Same thing, you will hear um, that he went at great lengths to communicate with her, try to get her to do investigation. He was giving her information. The state talked about these burned up bodies and other things to get dental and DNA. That was Mr. Turney that was getting that information to Phoenix Police Department. He was working with them to try to get the case going. You'll see that over, up until about 2008, 2009, he was one of the only ones champion for Alyssa and was trying to get this case out, calling the FBI, calling these people, trying to get them to investigate, and no one would investigate. Then fast forward to 2008, 2009, when Detective Anderson and Detective Summershoe were assigned. They started doing interviews, and they got tunnel vision. They were locked into one person and one person only, and that was Mr. Turney. And for over a decade, they extensively and exclusively overlooked evidence and just looked at him, ignoring all the things that he did, ignoring all the stuff, because they had a gut, they had their belief on what happened. And you will learn that this entire case is about belief, speculation, and conjecture. There's no evidence. They can't tell you where Alyssa died. They can't tell you how she died. And frankly, they can't even tell you if she died. They believe she did, but there's no proof. And despite over a decade of extensive investigation, they never found a single piece of evidence to tie Mr. Turney to this crime. As you will see, as the evidence comes through, there is nothing. There is nothing that links him to this crime. You will not hear from a single witness in this trial that will tell you what happened to Alyssa. This trial is about Michael Turney finally getting his day in court, a court that follows the laws of the American justice system, not the court of public opinions. The evidence will show that rather conduct, than conduct a fair investigation to find out the truth of Alyssa's runaway and subsequent disappearance, Phoenix PD did basically nothing for eight years until Detective Anderson and Detective Summershoe were assigned and then it was tunnel vision. They had one person and one person only, and they still found no evidence. You will learn that in 2000, after the pressure of some media, TikTok, stuff like that, they finally charged Mr. Turney with this crime, despite the lack of any physical evidence or frankly, any real evidence at all. No new evidence from 2000 to 2019 that links Mr. Turney to this crime. But yet here we are. So what happened to Alyssa? Was she killed? Did she run away and get caught up in human trafficking? Did she just want to leave and have a different life and just start it over? We don't know. All we can tell you is that on May 17th, 2001, that was the last time Mr. Turney ever saw his daughter. And he looked for her for over seven or eight years, spending his own money, his own time to try to find her. He spent countless years of his life in an effort to find Alyssa. He complained, he called Congress, he complained to police detectives, he complained to police chiefs, he wrote letters, he did all of this. Very odd for someone who killed someone. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about the different types of evidence in Arizona. Um, if you remember, during voir dire, we talked about a little bit. Mr. Imbrodino told you a story or a, a, an example of circumstantial evidence about rain, that you obviously you don't see the rain, but you walk outside, stuff's wet, the car's wet, the grass is wet, the street's wet. You can make and you can deduce from those other clues that it rained. So absolutely right. In Arizona, circumstantial and direct evidence 
are both allowed. And you as the jury, you get to give any weight to any piece of evidence that you feel is important. Now, I want to give you an example about circumstantial evidence too, just to kind of bear how circumstantial evidence can sometimes not lead to what you think it does. So I'm going to object. This is argument. Sure. Just take You will find that the state's entire case is based on circumstantial evidence, based on speculation, based on belief, with no actual facts. The evidence will show that the lack of evidence that the state is presenting, that you remember, you took the jury, you took an oath to keep an open mind and listen to all the evidence and decide whether the state has met their burden. And at the end of the trial, I will come back up here and ask you to find him not guilty. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. The state may call its first witness. Judge, please call Ms. Shea Masterson. Ma'am, if you'll please come forward uh, up to me and the uh, clerk will get your name from you and swear you in. If you want to come this way. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, so, well, hold on. Uh, hold on. Uh, right up to me. That's okay. That's okay. You can come right up to me and then turn towards her. She's going to get some information from you and then swear you in. And now if you'll take a walk up that ramp and then have a seat on the witness stand here to my right. There is a microphone there that is bent away from you. If you can bend it towards you, try to speak into that. Thank you. Counsel, you may proceed with your direct examination of the witness whenever you're ready. Thank you, Judge. Can you please introduce yourself to the court? I'm Shay Masterson. Okay. And Shay, um, at times we may cover stuff that's a little bit emotional for you. If you need to take a break, just let us know. How did you know Alyssa? I grew up with Alyssa from the time I was two or three. Okay. And did you know some of Alyssa's family members as well? Yes. Who did you know um, that were in her family? I knew her mom and her stepdad, as well as her brothers and her sister. All right. Now, uh, you said you knew her at quite a young age? Mm-hmm. And the family? Was that a yes? Oh, sorry, yes. And, yes, uh, and the family. And that's a good reminder. Um, mm-hmm's and ums are not picked up well. Okay. So when a question's asked, um, if it's a yes, just say yes, say no, and um, they'll make it easier for the court reporter. I will. Also, in that vein, if I ask a bad question that you don't understand, don't be afraid to tell me that's a bad question. Lawyers sometimes do that. Um, just ask me to rephrase it, and I'll try to do my best to say it in a way that is easier for you to understand. Okay, thank you. So you said you lived with, uh, you knew them at a younger young age, and you knew uh, a number of the family members? Yes. Do you remember the houses that uh, you knew them at or visited? Um, yes, I lived next door to them when they lived on the Villarita house. Um, I spent time in the other house in that same neighborhood that they lived in. Um, I spent a little bit of time in the house um, in the Paradise Valley area and um, a bit when Alyssa lived with her two brothers in an apartment. Okay, so... Fair enough. Fair to say that you knew uh, Alyssa while she lived at least three different houses, including in an apartment, and then also an apartment with her brothers. Correct. Do you remember who those brothers are that she lived with? That was John and Mike. Okay, and we'll we'll come back to them a little bit. Um, but did you spend time 
with Alyssa and her family at their house? Yes. Did you spend time with them um, in social settings? Um, yes. Most of that was at their house, though. All right. Did you know Alyssa at school at all? Um, the last time we went to school together was elementary school. And can you please explain, um, was there an age difference between you and Alyssa? Yeah, Alyssa was um, about two and a half years older than me and two years ahead of me in school. Okay. And did you know, you said you knew Sarah? Correct. And how old was Sarah in relation to you? About two years younger than me and two years behind me in school. Okay. So you noted some time that you spent with the family, but it was mostly at their residence. Is that correct? Correct. Can you tell us a little bit about Alyssa, the person that you knew? Um, she was really lighthearted and very friendly and social with people. Um, She was smart and funny um, and could be mean sometimes, like most girls. Did you see Alyssa interact with Sarah at all? Yes. And do you need to take a break? No. Okay. And what interactions did you observe with Sarah? Um, I mean, just everyday interactions between two sisters, they um, they had a, a sibling rivalry type of um, dynamic. Uh, you know, a lot of um, sister bickering and whatnot, but also a lot of love. Okay. And did you see interactions between Alyssa and her father? Yes. And was the interactions between Alyssa and her father um, contentious? Yes. Was it a difficult relationship based on your observations? Yes. And it, did it appear to be a troubled relationship based on your observations? Yes. Did you observe the way that Alyssa's father, the defendant, treated Sarah? Yes. And how, what was that treatment like? Um, it was uh, not contentious and not strained, and it tended to be she, she was the baby, and um, his, his only birth daughter, and so it was, she was very much, um, you know, doted on by him, at least in the early years. I can't speak to later on. So is it fair to say that the way that the defendant treated Alyssa was different than the way the defendant treated uh, uh, Sarah? Yes. Do you see the defendant in the courtroom today? Yes. Can you please state where he is seated and what he is wearing? Um, he's sitting uh, in a wheelchair, it looks like, to... Um, the side of a desk, and uh, I think it's a blue suit. Thank you. Your Honor, may the record reflect that the witness identified the defendant? The record will so reflect. Are you aware of recordings that were occurring at the Turney household? Yes. And what recordings were you aware of? Um, I know from a very early time there was recordings of, of telephone calls that would come in and out of the house. Um, and then I know that there was um, some um, audio and or video um, in, in the house at, uh, later on. So um, you were aware of phone conversations being recorded? Mm -hmm. Was that a yes? Oh, sorry. Yes, that's a yes. And you were aware of some type of surveillance system that was recording 
yes. occurrences in the house. Yes. Um, another thing we have to be careful about is not to speak over each other, because uh, that can also be difficult for our court reporter to take down. Um, so I apologize if I did that. Now, were you aware if the defendant would record just conversations between people that were not on the phone and were not surve video surveillance? Mm, not conversations specifically, but that there was recording happening at times in the house. I, I don't know okay. if that answers your question. That's fine. So you're aware, basically you're aware of general recordings, both surveillance, phone, that were occurring in the house and on the phone? Yes. Can you tell us, well, when you were leading, when uh, led up to Alyssa's disappearance and when she was gone, how much time were you spending at Alyssa's house in the weeks and months leading up to that? Not very much. They had moved far, farther away from where I lived at that point. All right. And however, were you aware of who lived at that house? To my knowledge, it was uh, her sister and her stepdad and Alyssa. Sorry. So at that point, there was, there was no brothers that were living there? Not that I'm aware of, but that doesn't mean there weren't. And how did you become aware that Alyssa was gone? Um, Mike told me, the, the defendant. So when you say Mike, are you referring to the defendant? Yes. Uh, just for in case we do that again. And what did you do based on his information to you that Alyssa had gone missing? So he took me to their house where I spent time with Sarah. Do you remember how close in time from Alyssa uh, going missing to you being told of Alyssa's disappearance? Um, it was that day or the next day. And then you stated that you came over to their house and you were staying there uh, watching Sarah? On and off, yes. Do you remember about how old Sarah was at that time? So I believe she had just finished sixth grade. Um, so, or maybe seventh, around 12, give or take. Okay. Uh, Council, could you please approach off the record? I can just come right up. to remember where I left off, but I believe we were at, um, you had gone to uh, Alyssa's, the place where Alyssa lived, you had, um, based on information provided by the defendant, that she was missing, and you were watching uh, Sarah. Yes. Do you remember uh, what was occurring uh, during that time while you were at the house? Um. Usually me and Sarah would be hanging out, watching movies, playing games, um, and Mike would be coming in, the defendant would be coming and going. Okay. Um, that's, well, were you aware, did the defendant tell you at some point that Alyssa had called the house? Yes. Do you remember how long after Alyssa had disappeared, that uh, that occurred. Um, 
maybe a week. It was pretty early on after. All right. And do you were you at the house when that call came in? So I believe it was at night, and he told us the next day, from what I remember, me and Sarah. And based on what you said, does that mean you were sleeping over there as well? Yes. Okay. Um, and while you were there, um, was it just the defendant, yourself, and Sarah? From what I can remember, yes. That, were actu that was actually staying there? That's what I remember. Did he tell you any specifics about that phone call? Um, not that I recall. And uh, how long did you continue to stay uh, at, with the defendant and Sarah? Um, I, I would come and go that summer. I don't remember exactly, you know, how long or for when. I know that there were multiple occasions during that summer um, for maybe a couple days at a time and then not after that summer. One more here. And, and just because it came up, um, you stated that the defendant's in a wheelchair now. Back when you were staying at the house, was the defendant uh, need the assistance of a wheelchair at that time? No. Uh, no additional questions, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Paley. Cross-examination, Ms. Hicks. Good afternoon, ma'am. Ms. Masterson, out of all of Alyssa's friends, you knew her the longest. I believe so. You knew her, um, you met her in 1989. Yes. Do you need a moment? No. Okay. You were friends with her until her disappearance in 2001? Yes. Okay. And you testified on direct that you talked a little less frequently in the year leading up to her disappearance. Yes. But you were still best friends. I still considered her my best friend, yes. Your families had known each other for years. Yes. And Mike actually called you on the night that Alyssa went missing. I believe it was that night. And he was looking for Alyssa. That is what I was told, yes. Okay. But Alyssa wasn't there. No. And so at that point, you went over to the house, the attorney's house. Yes. And you were there to babysit Sarah. Yes. You stayed there on and off all summer. Yes. So you saw what was happening in the house in the days after Alyssa's disappearance. Yes. I mean, you were there, right? It's yeah. been over 20 yeah. years. So, <laughs> so yes, I, the details are a fu fuzzy. Yes, understandable. Um, and and ma'am, if there's anything, you know, when I'm asking questions that you don't remember, let me know and we can... Um, assist you with a police report or something like that. Okay. Um, but you had mentioned to the police that Mike was obsessed with finding Alyssa. Um, yeah, it seemed that way that summer. Okay. It's all he talked about. That I can recall. He spent most of his time trying to find her. He spent most of his time away from the house saying that he was trying to find her. He took trips to California. I believe so. He searched the neighborhood. That was my understanding. He talked to Alyssa's friends. I believe so. 
And man, there's also a point where he asked Alyssa's friends to write letters. Um, yes. And you told the police that these letters were to prompt the police to look for Alyssa. That's from my recollection, yeah. Okay. And you wrote a letter as well. Mm -hmm. okay. Was that a yes? Sorry, yes. You described Alyssa as trusting. Yes. You expressed concern that she could be with an older man. Yes, that's what I had been told. You expressed concern in the letter that she was kidnapped. Or Possibly. Could, okay. that she could have been kidnapped. That someone was hurting her. Possibly. And as far as you know, at that time, the police hadn't been looking into Alyssa's disappearance. No. In your letter, you said Alyssa was in danger. I believed so. She hadn't contacted anyone. Correct. This was very concerning. Yes. Okay. Something was wrong. Yes. Okay. Your letter communicated a sense of urgency Yes. Your letter didn't say, Alyssa is a responsible person. No. Your letter didn't say, Alyssa is capable of taking care of herself. No. Because the letter was meant to get the police to start looking for Alyssa. That was what I thought, yes. Now, Ms. Masterson, you testified on direct that you were actually at the house on uh, May 24th, 2001. Sometime in the days after, yes. And you testified that you were there when, or at least you were sleeping, when uh, there was a phone call received from California. That's what I remember. Now, this was about a week after Alyssa's disappearance. I believe so. And you heard about it as soon as you woke up? I think so. Mike said it was Alyssa. Yes. And there was some time after this phone call was received that Mike tried to get more information about this phone call. Yes. Mike had a fight with the phone company to get information about this call. He was on the phone with customer service. I believe so. He tried to get a subpoena for records. Yes. Okay. And eventually he sued the phone company. That's what I understand, yes. Okay. He got the records. I believe so. And the call was from California. Yes. Now, ma'am, you had mentioned that you spent um, you spent quite some time over at the Turney household. In my life, yes. Um, you knew Sarah. Yes. You babysat her for a summer. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Um, and Alyssa is older than Sarah. Correct. Right, by about, is it five years? Um, four to five years, something like that. So, Alyssa was 17 at the time that um, she went missing. Yes. Sarah was 12. Yes. So, you knew Sarah from when she was little, child, to preteen years. Um, I still know Sarah, but yes, from the time she was an infant. But you interacted the most with Sarah. Um, you didn't interact with Sarah during her teenage years much. Not very much at all, no. Hey, Ma'am, I just have a few more questions um, about your relationship with Alyssa. Um, and again, if you need a break, let me know. Um, so 
So you met Alyssa when you were neighbors. Yes. You spent a lot of time with her throughout your childhood. Yes. And eventually Alyssa moved. Yes. But you remained in contact. Yes. And you and Alyssa experienced a traumatic event together during the summer of 2000? Um, I'm, can you please be more specific? You and Alyssa had a friend named Stacy. Yes. Okay. You were very close. Yes. And in the summer of 2000, Stacy committed suicide. Um, at the start of the school year, yes. This is a very traumatic event. Yes. And you knew Alyssa since childhood, so you knew that Alyssa experienced a lot of grief over her lifetime. Yes. Her mother died when she was young. Yes. She didn't have a female role model. Not in her family. She didn't have a mother to care for her. No. Her biological father wasn't around. Correct. She didn't get along with her stepfather. Correct. Alyssa moved around a lot during her childhood. Yes. She lived in California. Yes. Montana. Yes. Alyssa went to two different high schools. Correct. She transferred to a new high school at the beginning of her junior year. That sounds right. And you were very close with her despite all of that. Yes. You knew a lot about her personality, what she liked, what she didn't like. Yes. <laughs> Activities that she engaged in. Um, yes. You knew Alyssa smoked a lot of pot? I know that she smoked pot. Okay. And you told the police that there was a time where you believed it was close to every day? Um, if that's what I said then, then okay. I don't recall now. But if that's what you said to the police, then that would yes. be your testimony here today as well? I, that I told the truth then, yes. You were also aware of Alyssa experimenting with other drugs? I believe so, but no specifics. And again, I know that this is a long time ago, um, but I'm relying on the police report here. Mm -hmm. And in the police report, you said, or during the police interview, you had mentioned that Alyssa tried acid a year before she disappeared. Okay. So I'm asking you if that's correct. That's correct that I said that. I do not have that memory now. But it's been, what, 15 years since that interview? And you wouldn't have lied in the interview, right? No, absolutely not. Okay. Just as I won't now. That's right. why I'm not saying that I remember that now. Yeah. Okay. Just a moment, Your Honor. Just a couple follow-up questions. Um, I want to circle back to the letter discussion that we had earlier about the letter that you wrote for the police. Um, was that a letter that um, that you wrote with the understanding that it would be sent to the police? I believe so. Okay. I only have memory of the letter from when I read it at, when the police interviewed me. Okay. All right. At that time, I didn't remember writing the letter either. And Ms. Masterson, who was it that asked you to write the letter? The defendant. Okay. All right. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you, Ms. Hicks. Mr. Bailey, any redirect? So you were asked a number of questions, um, very quick order, about Alyssa. And 
suicide, marijuana, and things of that nature. You remember that? Yes. Was Alyssa a depressed person? No, not that I remember. Did, do you remember Alyssa having friends? Yes. And do you remember Alyssa having plans and things she wanted to do in her future? Yes. Do you remember Alyssa, did Alyssa, you said Alyssa and Sarah fought? Yes. But do you remember Alyssa caring for Sarah? Yes. Do you remember yes, sorry. Alyssa caring about Sarah's well-being? Yes. In your observations of Alyssa and Sarah, do you remember, what would you describe Alyssa as trying to do for Sarah? I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're asking. The interaction between Sarah and Alyssa, what type of role did you observe Alyssa try to play for Sarah? I'm, I mean, I don't, I, she was her big sister and as close to a mother as she had. You were, you were asked about a number of things that you were told the defendant was doing and trying to find Alyssa. Recall that? Yes. Who told you that they were trying to do that? The defendant. Did you have any knowledge of the defendant actually going out and doing those things? Nothing that I specifically witnessed. I would stay at the house with Sarah. And uh, this letter that you wrote looking for Alyssa? Yes. Do you remember if you were told what to put in the letter? I don't remember actually writing it. From what is written, I imagine that a 14-year-old writing that letter was, you know, guided on what the letter should say to elicit a response of trying to find her. You remember uh, stating, um, telling uh, defense counsel that that Alyssa moved a lot with her family. The, I yeah, that's the phrasing that they used. And and who was having Alyssa move so often? Her stepfather. Do you do you remember about when Alyssa's mother passed away? Um, I believe it was around 91, 92. So are we talking about at least years prior to when Alyssa went missing? Oh, many years. just to clarify, one of the questions I asked you was about various things that you were concerned about, either in the letter or that defendant was telling you that he was doing. When you said you were concerned that Alyssa may have been with an older man, who told you that was a possibility? Her stepfather. So was it fair to say that the information that your that you remember and the concerns that you had, the source of those was from the stepfather, the defendant? No further questions, Your Honor. 
Ladies and gentlemen, any members of the jury have any questions for the witness? It appears that there are none. May the witness be excused? Witness may, Your Honor. Any objection? No objection. Thank you, ma'am. You may be excused. Thank you. And the state may call its next witness. Call Sarah Kern. Uh, ma'am, if you'll please come forward and uh, provide your name to the clerk, she'll swear you in as well. And ma'am, if you'll please take a walk up the ramp and have a seat on the witness stand here to my right. Mr. Imbordino, you may proceed with your direct examination whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Turney, can you tell us your name, please? My name is Sarah Turney. Sarah is S-A-R-A-H? Uh, yes. Okay. There is a microphone. There you sound like you may be soft-spoken like I am, so if you can concentrate on that for me. Okay. Um, so... How old are you now? I'm 34. And are you employed? Uh, yes. What, what do you do? I make podcasts for a living. All righty. I'm not even sure I know what a podcast is. So maybe everybody else does, but if you could explain exactly what it is you do. Sure. Um, I do a few different things. So I created my own podcast um, in part to help look for Alyssa. And I also host another podcast from Spotify where I'm just a host for them. All righty. How long have you been doing that? Since 2019. The, um, some of these questions may seem silly to you. I'm just trying to establish some background information. So did you graduate from high school? No. Um, did you attend high school? Yes. Where did you go? Paradise Valley. The, um, so explain to us the, the makeup of your family. You, Alyssa, the brothers, your dad, um, just so we have a clear understanding of who's who. Yeah, um, my dad married his first wife, I believe, in the 70s, Cheryl, and they had three children together, my three oldest brothers, Rhett, James, and Mike. And then um, my mother had Alyssa and John, um, John before Alyssa. Alyssa was the youngest uh, before I came. Then my mom met my dad, and together they had me in 1988. And obviously you wouldn't have known it, but today, do you know where it was uh, they were living when you were born? Uh, yeah, at uh, Villarita. Okay. An address, a, a house on Villarita? I know the full address if you'd like it. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, 2954 West Villarita. And where was that located? Here in the valley? Yeah, the west side of Phoenix. All righty. Do you know how long you lived at that address? It was until um, sixth grade. I, I went to sixth grade at a different school. So first through the fifth grade? Yeah, and then I guess I would say first through fourth grade, and then we moved to that one house that was kind of around the corner but in the same neighborhood. And then from there, for sixth grade, we moved to the east side of Phoenix. So, all right. So first through the fifth grade, did you attend the same elementary school? Um, except for the portion where we lived in Montana for about six months, yes. All righty. While you were here in the Valley, first through the fifth grade, what elementary school did you attend? Sunrise Elementary. Now, Alyssa was older than you, right? Yes. And uh, by, is it four years, five years? Yeah, about, about four. All righty. So when you were in the fifth grade, um, do you know what school Alyssa was attending? I believe Deer Valley. Okay. 
I believe it was Deer Valley, Barry Goldwater, and then Paradise Valley. Three different high schools? Yes. And when she changed schools, was it because y'all had changed addresses? If you know. Well, and that's where the confusion comes in because I never, I just changed the school uh, the one time. So I wasn't made to change schools necessarily when she was. So I'm not quite sure what that situation was. All right. The, um, so you, you said that y'all lived in Montana for a period of time? Yes. How old would you have been? Six or seven. It was second grade, I believe. And how long did you live there? Less than a year. And then you moved back to the valley? Yeah, right back to that Villarita house. All righty. And have you lived in the valley ever since? Yes. <clears throat> was there um, were, was there ever a time when you and Alyssa and the brothers were all living in the same house? Yes, when we were younger. And then um, periodically a brother would come in or out, you know, for a few weeks or months if they needed somewhere to stay for a, a variety of reasons. Now, in May of 2001, where were your brothers living? I don't mean the address, but... They were all out of the house. And did they, were they living here locally? Um, Rhett... Mike and John were, I believe James was already out of the state, possibly on the East Coast at that time. He's moved around a bit. All righty. So in May of 2001, where were you going to school? Explorer Middle School. And you're, you're living, at that point in time, when Alyssa goes missing, you're living at that address on 34th Street, correct? Yeah, the 17217. And who lived there with you at that time? Just my father and Alyssa. How would you get to school? So I was supposed to go to it when we moved. Uh, we moved so many times, so I'm sorry if it's a little confusing, but we moved and I was supposed to go to a different middle school for eighth grade, but my dad contested it and called the school and uh, made sure I could go to the same school. So I, uh, he would end up driving me to a bus stop and then the bus would take me all the way to school. So he dropped me off like in our old neighborhood. All righty. And then how would you get home? Um, I would, again, be taken back by the bus to that bus stop, and then he'd come pick me up in his vehicle. Was he working at that time? No. The, um, now, Alyssa, how, how would she get to school? Um, so it was usually by vehicle, as far as I remember. The walk was just long enough, and it was just warm enough that we usually didn't walk to Paradise Valley. But, but it just depended on the day. So if she didn't walk to school, how would she get there? Our father. Did Alyssa drive? No. Uh, were you ever with her when she did drive? Yes. So it sounds like maybe she knew how to drive. She knew how to drive, but she was afraid to before she was gone. To your knowledge, did she ever obtain a driver's license? No. No, she didn't? Or? No, she did not obtain a driver's license. All righty. I want to take you back to, uh, well, first of all, for background, like what's the first memory that you have of Alyssa? Probably a... Uh dancing in our kitchen to uh used to be power 93 back then it's power 98 now uh just dancing in our kitchen to boys to men how old do you think you were then uh maybe seven somewhere around there and we probably covered this already but where would you have been living at that point at our villarita home that was our childhood home and at that point, were any of your brothers still living at home? Uh, yeah, I believe so. I think Mike specifically. Now, if you need to take a break, let us know. Thank you. So, your mom dies. How old are you when your mom dies? I was four. And... Um, 
when your mom died, were were y'all living here in the valley? Uh, we we went back and forth from California, but we came back to Arizona, and I believe that's where she finally died. Yeah. Okay. So, did you live in California for a short period of time? And where did you live? Redding, California. Right. Did. Um, in 2001, did you have an aunt or a couple of aunts? Your mom, would they be your mom's sisters living in California? Her one sister, Lynette, yes. All right, Lynette. Is, is Lynette alive now? No, she's since passed. She lived in California? Yes. And do you recall where? I believe it was Riverside, but she also, you know, moved a few times over the years. Uh, did you know her? No, not really. Um, especially before Alyssa went missing, we had no relationship with her. So you and Alyssa had not, for example, your father hadn't taken you over to California and you spent time visiting with Lynette? No, and the one time we tried to reconcile, she never showed up. So Alyssa and I were really upset and just didn't want to pursue a relationship after that. Do you know when that was prior to uh, May of 2001? I can safely say within two years. So, uh, you've obviously been sitting in court today, right? And um, the judge has told the jury that victims' family are allowed to, to, to stay in court. So, you heard Miss Masterton's testimony, correct? Yes. Uh, do you remember Shay? Yeah, of course. Um, do I understand that the two of you are still, are you still friends? Yeah, we keep in contact. Now, do I have this right that she is a little older than you, but she was younger than Alyssa? Yeah, she was right in between us. So if I were to ask you, Mr. Bailey asked um, Shay to describe your sister. If I were to ask you the same question, what would, what can you tell us about Alyssa? Yeah, um, you know, we definitely fought like sisters, but uh, she was just really kind and protective. Um, that was the biggest thing is, you know, for as much as she would make fun of what I was wearing, um, she would make sure to fix my outfit before I went out the door. Um, and I think it was a lot harder to see when I was a kid, you know, the stuff that she did, how she made Christmas happen and birthdays happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, Alyssa was happy and outgoing um, when she was outside of the house, I will say. Um, she was just a really good big sister and she definitely took on all those maternal duties, even if I didn't see it back then. So, so as you look back, can you describe for us some ex examples of the things that she would do for you. You said like um, a maternal figure, if I understood what you were saying. Uh, can you d describe for us you know, what that would look like? Yeah. Um, I remember specifically one time we were supposed to go see the Nutcracker um, with uh, our brothers. Sure, Your Honor, I'm going to object relevance to relationship. Uh, sustained. The... Um, well, you said you were. Possibly had sister rivalry, but. Um, she did things for you. Correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. So tell us what Alyssa was. Just tell us what Alyssa was like. She was um, really kind. I remember that she always made sure that, like she was always getting special gifts for her friends, um, always spending her money on other people. Um, she was just really bubbly and outgoing and um, she was really, really brave, really brave. Now, <clears throat> in the, um, the months prior to May of 2001, did Alyssa have a job? Yes. Where did she work? Jack in the Box. And do you recall what sort of schedule she had? 
It was after school, obviously, and then some weekends. Do you recall, uh, for example, how many days a week? Not specifically. I mean, it was part-time. So how, how would she get to work? Our father. Or, uh, I'm sorry, because uh, the high school is right across the street from Jack in the Box, so if her schedule aligned, I believe she would just walk right over. It was, you, you just cross 40th Street, and it's right there. All righty. Did you ever visit her at the, at the Jack in the Box? Yes. Uh, so what would you observe her doing there? Um, working, mostly. Yeah. What, what was her job? Um, I don't know what her exact job at Jack in the Box was. I think she did a little bit of everything. Drive through, helping people at the counter, cleaning tables. And from what you observed, did um, did she like her job? Yeah. Did you have a um, Did you have a job when in May of two thousand and one? No, I did not. Okay. And remind me, please, what grade were you in then? Seventh grade. And remind me what, so that would be like middle school? Yes. We used to call it junior high, but I mean, it's, it's middle school, right? Yeah, the same thing. Seventh and eighth grade usually, I believe in Arizona, is a middle school or junior high. Okay. And um, where was that school located in relationship to the house on 34th Street? It was quite some distance away. It was, um, it's right next to Desert Ridge at Tatum and, uh, what is it? Joe Max or Beardsley? So I may have misunderstood. Is that is that where <clears throat> your father the de would take the defendant would take you to the bus stop? No, he would take me to the bus stop in our old neighborhood, and that was closer to like Forty Third Street and Bell, so about ten blocks. So how would you get to school in the seventh grade? Um, so that's that's what he would do is he would drive me to that bus stop, and then that bus stop would take me to school. All right. What generally, um, let's assume that you had the, the normal school day. What time would, would you arrive in the seventh grade? What time would you arrive to school? Yeah, Explorer started later, so I think it was 9 or 9.30, and then it ended at 3.30, I believe. And what about May 17th? 2001. Did you go to school there? Yes. Um, was that the last day of school for you that year? Yes. And was there anything s special planned for the students? Yeah, we went on a field trip to Waterworld. All righty. And do you recall what time you would have gone? It was uh, shortly after school began, so I believe we just came to school at the regular time and got situated and got on the bus and went. That particular day, do you, um, did you see how, actually see how Alyssa got to school? No. Do you have any recollection as to whether Alyssa was home when you went to school that day? She was not there. Her school started much earlier than mine. You, the, the field trip was over about what time? Um, it was about when we got out of school, so about 3.30. And was anyone supposed to pick you up? Yes, my father. And there at the school? Yes. Um, so when you got back to the school, did did he pick you up? No. Was he there? No. So what did you do? I walked home with my friends. How far away from the school did, did they live? It was like the next two or three blocks over, so it, it was really like maybe a five-minute walk at most. Could you have walked home from school? I, I probably wouldn't have made it, um, especially in the summer. I mean, I think it's three or four miles, if not more, so no. I mean, I, I probably could have, but I wouldn't have. Now, did you have a cell phone then? No. <clears throat> did Alyssa? Yes. So you get to your friend's house, and um, uh, 
Did, did someone come and pick you up at your friend's house? Yes, my father. So if you, what time it was it that you think you got back from the field trip? Back to the school or back to my friend's house? I'm sorry, back to the school. I think it was just about right on time. I think we were ready to go at about 3.30. And then you walked to your friend's house? Yes. At about what time do you think it was when you got to your friend's house? No later than four, or 15 minutes later, I would say, 3.45. And then at some point, your father came and picked you up? Yes. Um, had you called him or? I don't recall. I think we just kind of knew that if I wasn't at the school, I'd be at my friend's house. It was, it was something I did all the time. Mr. Bordino, you tell me when we're, when we're a good breaking point. That's fine. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our afternoon recess a little early today because we're going to be ending a little early today. So uh, you can leave your uh, notebooks and your materials on your chair if you'd like. Uh, please be back in the jury room uh, not later than 3 o'clock, which is when we'll restart the afternoon session. Please remember the admonition. The jury is now excused. Please be seated. Let the record show the presence of counsel and the defendant. Jury's not present. Anything for the record from the state? No, sir. Anything for the record from the defense? No, Your Honor. All right, we'll see you at 3 o'clock. We are at recess.
Thank you. Please be seated. Be seated. We are back on the record in State versus Cherney. Let the record show the presence of counsel, the defendant, and the jury. Uh, and uh, the witness is back on the witness stand. Mr. Imbordino, you may resume your direct examination whenever you're ready. Thank you. Okay, Sarah, I got a little ahead of myself. I'm going to back us up just a tad. You've already told us a little bit about Alyssa and how you saw her. Um, her... Well, let me ask you this. Remind me again how old, you, you told us your first memory, I'm not asking you that again, but about how old were you? Seven, did you say seven years old? Your first memory? Yeah. Of Alyssa? Yeah, I'd say that's about right. And so did you live with her from that point in time up until she disappeared in May of 2001? Yeah, I lived with Alyssa my whole life. I don't think I ask you this, but um, describe her personality to us. Yeah, she was fun and bubbly and outgoing and sometimes a mean older sister. Um, but it also depended on what setting she was in. And what do you mean by that? What setting? When she was outside of the house, she was a lot happier. Did, in those years that you described living with Alyssa, was there a time that it changed or was it always that way? No, as far as I can remember, it was just always a bad relationship with Alyssa and my father, which caused just a lot of stress and tension. Would you ever hear them argue? Yes. What would they argue about? Everything. So, when you say everything, like what, for example? I mean, it was a lot of criticism of Alyssa. It was a lot of, why aren't you doing A, B, and C in school? Why aren't you being nicer to Sarah? He wanted her to do more around the house, to cook more, to drive and do uh, errands, picking up prescriptions for him, going grocery shopping, that type of thing. He never wanted her to leave the house. Okay. 
you, you um, while living at the, the various locations in <clears throat> here in the valley, let's just stick to the valley over the years, uh, were you ever aware that phone calls coming to the house or going out from the house were being recorded? Yes. And how did you know that? I was born into it ever since I can remember that recorder was on the phone or a version of a recorder. And let's talk about the, the house on 34th Street. Where was that um, recorder set up? On 17217? Yes. Um, that, well, I'm sorry, the monitor or the actual cameras? No, I'm, let's talk about the, I'm sorry, the, the audio recording for phone calls. That was in the kitchen. And where in the kitchen? It was right by the phone. And um, how, how were calls recorded? In other words, today we have digital recording. Uh, how, what was u utilized at that point? It was one of those old school tape machines where um, you could, every time you picked up the receiver, you could hear it click on really loud. It wasn't like a touch screen or anything. So I, I guess I'd describe it as like an old school recorder tape deck. It's about that big, rectangle. So when you say that big, <laughs> um, this young lady, the record needs, to, you're talking about a foot or so? Uh, maybe nine inches to a foot. All righty. You happen to remember what the brand was? No. And um, how <clears throat> did you know how to insert the, the tapes? Yes. And can you describe that for us? Yeah, you just uh, press stop or eject. I can't remember if it was the same button. Um, and then pop out, put another tape in. Was there only just a tape in the recorder? There? No. There were also blank tapes next to the recorder. When someone would call, in other words, an incoming call, you, you mentioned that you, you could hear a click. Could you hear what that person was saying? Uh, well, the click came as soon as you picked up the receiver, the machine would click on. Um, but yeah, you could still hear them through the receiver. What if somebody was leaving a message? Let's say you're, so it's in the kitchen. Let's assume you were, you know, in the kitchen doing dishes, doing something you, either you didn't want to answer the phone when it rang or, or couldn't for some reason, and someone left a message. Could you hear them talking if you recall? You understand what I'm asking you? No, I'm sorry. Hear them talking through which through the recorder device? Yes. Um, I believe we had a separate voicemail machine at that time. Okay. So separate machines. Or possibly it was on the phone at that point for voicemail. But for the recorder, you had to physically pick up the phone for it to record. So I do not believe that it recorded voice messages. Okay. So if um, somebody called, well... For example, let me assume there are recorded calls. Um, what I'm trying to understand is you pick up the phone, the way you're describing it, the recorder would start. Yes. And that's that clicking sound that you heard. Yes. You could physically hear on the machine because it was, you know, and the machine's very throughout the years, but. Um, at least until up to that point, it was the older machines where you could physically hear the click. Now, and let's, um, but that wasn't just at that house. That was at other homes that you lived in. Every home we lived in, yes. Now, the house there on 34th Street where uh, you were living when Alyssa went missing, w were you aware of any video surveillance cameras? Yes. How did you know that they were there? One was very obvious, the one on the carport um, by the door. That was very obvious. 
And then my father approached me about the hidden camera in the vent and told me about that. Would you have known that it was there if he hadn't told you? No. What, do you recall when that was that he told you approximately? Uh, within a year of Alyssa being gone. So you were not aware of it until after she was missing? Uh, no, I was aware of it before she went missing. And I probably didn't ask the question correctly. So how did you become aware of it being in the vent? My father told me. He said, look what I set up. This is to watch your sister. Okay. And Alyssa was to not know. Now, may I approach the window? You may. Yes, this is the house that Alyssa was last seen in. I'd just I'd like to see him before she starts talking about him. Yeah. <laughs> just show me him. I'll, I'll just take a look. Your Honor, move to admit Exhibit 79. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. Exhibit 79 is admitted. Ladies and gentlemen, when an exhibit is admitted, that means that it will be with you in the jury room during your deliberations. Okay. Let's see. So for the record, this, ex this exhibit contains a number of images. Looking at, I'll refer to it as page one. It's not labeled as page one, but the first image. So what are we looking at here, sir? Um, that's the house that Alyssa last lived in. With you and the defendant? Yes. Now, the car, well, okay. Assume for me that these photographs were not taken until 2008, okay? You, you, you weren't living there in 2008, right? Correct. You had moved. Yes. From, where did you move to? Directly across the street uh, from this angle. If you were looking out the front door of the other house, this is what you'd see. All right. Do you remember when you moved into this particular house? Shortly after, oh, this house? Yes. Um, it would have been 1999, 2000. All righty. And um, how many bedrooms did it have? Three. The, have a backyard? Yes. Was there a fence? Yes. Was there a back patio? Yeah, I think like a concrete slab. All righty. Now, as we look at this, I see it appears there's a front door. You see that? Yes. Did y'all utilize the front door? No. And the carport, since this was taken in 2008, we can, can we assume that that vehicle was not yours or your dad's? Correct. Did you know the people that moved into the home? I'm sure I met them before, but no. At this time in 2008, no, I didn't know those people. I can't remember if I asked you this. Um, do you know when you had moved across the street? Shortly after Alyssa was gone. So maybe in 2001? That or 2002. 
it was shortly after. So over here on the right-hand side, the carport, I see there's a, looks like there's a door to the far right-hand side. What, what was that? That was a storage room. I believe the washer and dryer was in there. The second image. I got to remember to stay close to this microphone. This, uh, do you see the open door? Yes. Where did that door way lead to? Uh, the kitchen, well, it, it was kind of in between. So the kitchen would be on the right, and then a small area where we had our dining table and the living room was to the left. So if, when you're inside the house, and in the times when y'all are living there, you didn't use the front door, how would you exit the home? Through this door. Now, would you be able to tell us where the surveillance camera was mounted in the carport? It was on that opposite side so that you could see this door almost diagonal from it. All right. Third picture, what are we looking at here? This is part of the kitchen, and where that table is is about where we had our dining room table as well. All righty. In this, now it looks like there is, you know, I refer to it as French doors, but um, looks like doors leading to the backyard. Yes. All righty. In this particular image, would, would we be able to see where the uh, recording, the phone recording device was located? Yes. Okay, where, where would it have been? Right in that corner where you kind of see the cord hang down. Um, the whole phone and setup and everything was right there. Right here? Yeah. I guess wherever the microwave is, maybe if that's the microwave. Okay. Below and kind of to the, as you look at the photograph, to the right of the clock that's on the wall, right? Yeah, right at that corner. Here's a fourth photograph. Can we see more of the kitchen in this one? Yes. Now, other than the the um, knowing that somebody else is living there, these are these. This property is not yours. Is the the kitchen still laid out the same as when you lived there? Yes, they appear to be the same counters and cabinets. This particular door here to the right, what was that? Mr. Ambordino, you're off uh, screen. You either need to go wider or move the picture up. Okay, sorry. The door here on the right was what? Um, I believe it was a utility room. The washer and dryer may have been in there. I can't quite remember. Now, in this image, again, are we looking at the kitchen? Yes. The door that we see here open, is that the doorway that led into the carport? Yes. And if you're standing at this kitchen counter, looking towards the wall where these two pictures are, what, what room would that have been? That would have been the restroom. Well, let me let me do it a different way. Let me go to the next image. What do we see here? So on the right, that would be the main front door that we did not use. All righty. What what did you refer to this as? Living room or? Yeah, the living room. Now the the camera that was in the vent. What room was that vent located in? The living room. And what are we looking at here? Another angle of the living room. Fireplace, was that there when you lived there? Yes. This door here and behind 
the sofa that's located in this picture, what door did that lead to? I believe it was the bathroom. I know where the bedrooms were, but I'm trying to remember. Yeah, that had to have been the bathroom. So I think you told us earlier there were three bedrooms, correct? Yes. And how many bathrooms? Um, two, including the master. So if this bathroom is, is that the master bathroom? No. The, the bedroom that you refer to as the master bedroom, who, who's, who stayed in that bedroom prior to Alyssa going missing? Our father. Now, if you look at the top of this particular image, between, we're right over the bath door and, over, and near the fireplace, it looks like there's two AC vents. Uh, do you see those? Yes. Do you know whether, was the camera in one of those vents, do you know? Yes, and the one to the left. This one here? Yes. The one over the bathroom? Yes. So I want you to imagine for us that, that you're standing in that living room and you're looking up at that vent where the camera was located. Could you see the camera? No. Give me a minute, Judge. I need to count <laughs> some pages here. So for the record, I'm on the ninth photograph. Now, what are we looking at here? What part of the house? The hallway that leads to the bedrooms. Were, were the three bedrooms on the same side of the house? No. Well, I'm the same area of the house, yes. So... If you're standing looking down this hallway, uh, Alyssa had her own bedroom? Yes. So what, keeping in mind, ask, standing here looking to my, my left, <laughs> this side of the image, mm -hmm. which side, left or right, was Alyssa, Alyssa's bedroom? To the left. What about yours? Also to the left. And the master bedroom? To the right. Photograph number 10. Again, ignoring maybe the, you know, the chairs, the barbecue unit. Um, do you recognize the backyard? Yes. The next image, which would be number 11. Um, we're, what, a, a view of the patio? Yes. And this particular window here to the, to the on the right-hand side, immediate where my finger is pointed, kind of uh, looks like it's lined up with this tree. Where did that window go? The master bedroom. Where your father stayed. Correct. Before Alyssa went missing, yes. Yes. Next image, which I think is 12, again, another photograph of the backyard, correct? Yes. And the, so the wooden, was there a gate back here that led somewhere? No. Final image. It looks like there was a gate, correct me if I'm wrong, that led from the backyard out to the 
towards the street. Yes. Do you recall whether there was there a gate there when you lived there? Do you remember? I can't remember. And then <laughs> looks like the address is on this beam here. Yes. Now you told us, uh, Sarah, that before Sarah went missing, you, the, your bedroom and Alyssa's bedroom were on the, the left-hand side of that hallway. Yes. Did that change after she went missing? Yes. When, when did it change? Probably around when the new school year started. So... August or September? Yeah, that sounds about right. And um, why did it change? My father moved me into the master bedroom. And, and where did he move to? My old bedroom. When you moved into the master bedroom, Did he tell you? Did he tell you why uh, he was going to have you stay in that bedroom? Yes. What, what was that? He didn't want to be accused of molesting me and having me walk around in the towel, so he wanted me to have my own bathroom. Okay. Objection. What is the objection? Yeah, this is the whole floor of the evidence. This is a piece of evidence. This is, this witness has never mentioned this before. This is suspect. Uh, I, I only need the basis of the objection. That's one word. Here's the 404B. Uh, the objections overruled. The uh, counsel, you may ask your next question. Thank you. The so when you got into the bedroom, um, was there any type of electronic equipment, or, for lack of a better word, in that bedroom? Yes, the entire video monitoring system lived in that room. And you mean for the surveillance cameras? Yes. Did you know how to operate it? Other, I mean, it operated like a basic VCR, um, but in terms of, I mean, I guess I knew how to put in a tape and press record, yeah. So um, am I understanding correctly that if you were going to have a tape recording the people walking out the door, for example, into the carport. The, it was a VHS tape? Yes. And it would be put into the, to the equipment in the bedroom, the master bedroom? Yes. Was there any particular reason why y'all didn't use the front door? I can't think of a good reason. It was often blocked, but, I mean, we used that front patio door since we moved in. You're talking about the carport door? Yes, I'm sorry, the carport. Okay. Um, all right. When you say that something was uh, blocking the front door, like what would that have been? Uh, pieces of furniture. The last I remember was a bookcase. Now, I want to go back to the May 17th. Sorry for jumping around. So your, your, your father comes to your friend's house. How did you know he was there? I can't recall if he called or if I just heard him out front or he came to the door. 
um, but it was sudden. And uh, did, did you get in the car with him? Yes. What kind of vehicle was he driving then? Uh, a white truck. Uh, did you get in the truck? Did you have a conversation? Yes. And what was it about? Uh, he turned to me and said, your sister's not answering her cell phone. And he handed me his cell phone and said, can you try to call her? And I tried. Now, were you aware that Alyssa had a cell phone? Yes. Do you know how long she had had it? Um, maybe for a year or so. Cell phones were still kind of not as common then. So I take it this wasn't like we might call a smartphone today, right? No, it was a Nokia. No, no internet capabilities as far as I remember. Okay. At some point, um, I'll get to that in a minute, but at some point, did you take possession of that cell phone? Yes. So he tells you that Alyssa's not answering her phone, and does he hand you his phone? Yes. To call? No answer. No answer. <laughs> um, did he... Did he tell you anything about what um, he and Alyssa had been doing that day? No. <clears throat> so where did you go from your friend's house? We went home. How long, whatever time of day it was, how, how, how approximately how long would it have taken you to get to the, back to the house on 34th Street? Maybe about 10 minutes. So what do you do when you get there? Where, do you, where does he park the truck? He parks in the carport. All right. Any conversation along the way? Not that I recall. Did he say anything to you about picking Alyssa up early from school? No. Anything about having lunch with Alyssa? No. Anything about having an argument with Alyssa? Not that I recall. So you get to the house. What do you do? I went right to Alyssa's room. That bedroom on the left. Yeah, it's the furthest one on the left. And uh, describe her room for us as it existed before she went missing. Yeah, um, when you walked in, she had a queen-size bed. I think it was a queen or a full. It was pretty big. Um, that was on the right. And then on the left-hand side was her dresser. And directly kind of in front um, by the window was this uh, TV stand that she had painted and a TV um, and then she had a makeup vanity to the left by her closet. Did Alyssa use makeup? Yeah. Um, did you spend time in Alyssa's room when the two of you were living in the house together? As much as I could, as much as she would let me in there, yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, did you enjoy going into her room? <clears throat> so you go into her room and describe what you see. So um, you walk in and I saw what looked like the contents of her backpack on the ground. It was a bunch of papers, as far as I recall. And then it, it's on a big room. So right to the left on her dresser, I saw the note and her cell phone right there on top. Now, you said a backpack. So... Did Alyssa use a backpack? Yes. And um, routinely, I mean, would she take it to school with her? Yes. What, what would she keep in there? I don't think she would have let me look. I probably would have gotten in big trouble if I got caught, so okay. I couldn't tell you for sure. All right. A bunch of jelly pens, I'm sure. The, uh, why do you say that? She liked to draw a lot, so. The, describe the backpack to us. After all these years, I think all I, I, I believe it was black, probably a black Jansport, but I, I can't tell you for sure. The, uh, the items that you saw on the floor, what do you remember about them? Just a bunch of papers. You remember what they, what they were? No. Like exam papers, school exam papers, or school books, anything like that? Um, 
I mean, they weren't drawings and it wasn't a diary. So yeah, it was like loose leaf papers. There might've been like a binder or uh, like a, a notebook, I should say. Now you mentioned that uh, she had a, a makeup um, table. Yes. I, I don't know, would you call it a vanity or? Yes. <laughs> All right. So um, anything, did you notice anything missing from her makeup? Mm, no. <clears throat> you said you found a note. Um, and I apologize, I don't have a copy of it with me real handy right now, but tell us again where this, this note was located. On the top of her dresser. And how did you come to see it? I mean, it was at eye level, you know what I mean? So it was right there to the left, right by her cell phone. Did you look at it? Yes. Um, without seeing it, and I'll show it to you, not today, uh, but what do you remember about the note? Um, do I mean, I remember, I believe, what it said. Would you okay. like me to say that? Sure. I believe it said, Dad and Sarah, when you dropped me off at school today, I decided I really am going to California. Dad, that's why I took $300 from you. Sarah, you always said you wanted me gone. Now you have it. Alyssa? Had your father dropped you and Alyssa off at school together that day? No. You said that her cell phone was there, correct? Yes. Um, and was it next to the to the note? Yes. <clears throat> How did you you said earlier that uh, you actually had tried to call call her cell phone yourself, correct? Yes. So when you get into the house, are you still you or your father still calling her cell phone number? I was not. I don't recall it buzzing at all. It was just in plain view. There was nothing else on top of the dresser. Do you remember seeing any kind of a particular piece of jewelry at all? She left behind a lot of her jewelry, yeah. Like what kinds of things that you recall? Yeah, there were, I mean, quite a few things, things that her friends had made her mostly, um, you know, because I always wanted everything Alyssa had, so I remember seeing it. Um, there was a necklace that her friend made that had a mushroom inside. There was one that was uh, like a Chinese symbol. Um, all of the jewelry from our mom was still there. In your uh, interactions with your sister, were those things based on what you observed of her and the jewelry? Were they things that were important to her? Yes. The cell phone, did, were you ever with her when she used her cell phone? Yes. Um, when would you see her with the cell phone? Once she had it, it was always with her. Now, I think I asked you earlier, did you ever come into possession of that cell phone? And I think you said yes. How did that happen? My father gave it to me shortly after she was gone. And up until that point in time, you you hadn't had a cell phone yourself? No, my father would sometimes lend me his, um, but no, I did not have my own cell phone. The I know this is a long time ago, so you, you used the cell phone once she was missing. Um, did you call people on it? Oh, yeah. Okay. What I'm trying to get at here is since we're talking about 2001, and I suppose some people didn't have a cell phone, but um, what what could you do with it besides call somebody? You could text and play Snake. Snake, okay. What's that? Um, it's a, uh, I'm trying to remember now. It's, I don't remember exactly how it works, but it's some game with a bunch of uh, squares that make a snake, and you have to, I think, I don't remember the rules of the game. Okay, all right. Now, did it have, so your dad gives it to you to use, right? Objection, ask the question. Uh, sustained. How did you 
I mean, did it have a passcode or a password or? No. Your Honor, the <laughs> I know I asked for 345. I've got a bunch of pictures I need to show her and ask her about. Um, I can't do it all in five minutes, I guess is what I'm trying to get at. Sounds like he's, this is a good breaking time. I think so. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, due to a scheduling conflict, uh, we're going to end a little early today. Uh, remember, we are not going to be together tomorrow. Uh, so I will see you next on Monday, July 10. Uh, we're going to get a 1030 start. So please do your best to get here uh, in time uh, for, uh, for the 1030 start. Have a nice weekend. Please take everything with you when you leave the courtroom. Please remember the admonition. The jury is now excused. Please be seated. Let the record show the presence of counsel and the defendant. Anything for the record from the state? Not right now, Judge, because I really need to get going. Monday, I'm going to ask permission to address the court on a ruling you made earlier today. Okay. You'll either give me permission to do it or not. I got to try to remember to do that Monday morning. Okay. Anything for the record from the defense? Not today. Okay. All right. Uh, counsel, if you could be here at 1015 on Monday and every day after that, I'd appreciate it. That way we can chat before the jury comes in uh, if we need to. Uh, have a nice weekend. We'll see you all Monday at 1015. We are adjourned. We are back on the record in State versus Turney. Let the record show the presence of counsel and the defendant. Jury is not present. In regard to the uh, objection during opening statements, the court has looked at the prior rulings. Uh, I didn't really find a ruling on point. There's a lot of rulings in this case. If you can point to one, I'm happy to consider it. But to the extent that the state is precluded from offering evidence to prove that a molest happened, the, the contract is, was ruled uh, permissible. The contract has Alyssa affirming that the defendant did not molest her. The state is introducing in opening statements a statement of the defendant saying that he did not molest her. Uh, I don't find a basis for a mistrial. The request for mistrial is denied. In regard to the uh, testimony of the witness, Masterson, uh, any additional information about the time frame of the incident? So just to clarify, uh, Ms. Masterson says that she the behavior that she observed, this behavior was constant beginning in preteen years and going into teen years. However, to follow up and try to get some more definite clarification from Ms. Masterson, um, she stated the most recent memory that she had was when Alyssa uh, was maybe at Goldwater High School, which would have put it about a year and a half to two years prior to the incident, Judge. Um, based on that, I told defense I would agree not to go into that area. Okay. 
Uh, I think that uh, resolves that motion. Anything else we can talk about before we bring the jury in? Um, are you going to use technology for your opening? No. Okay. Old school. I use technology. <laughs> one, one less thing to worry about. Please be seated. We are back on the record in State versus Cherney. Let the record show the presence of counsel, the defendant, and the jury. Mr. Jackson, you may proceed with the defense opening statement. On May 17, 2001, between 1 and 5.30, Alyssa left a note and left her family home. Michael and his youngest daughter came home between 5, 7 o'clock. They found the note in her room. Her room wasn't its normal, tidy self. Sarah had noticed that the contents of her backpack were strewn kind of on the floor. Books, pencils, stuff like that. She had also noticed that some clothes were taken. She noticed some jeans, some shirts, underwear, socks, and the backpack was missing. She didn't notice any sign of a struggle. No furniture was moved, no blood, nothing was there. There was nothing on her father, any defensive marks that she, that she noticed or anything. Couches in the living room, nothing was moved. Nothing was out of the ordinary except for Alyssa wasn't there. Now, you'll learn that Mr. Attorney Michael, he picked up Alyssa from school that day. They grabbed lunch and they went home to talk about the rules for the summer. He had some rules for her because she'd be kind of getting in trouble, doing some stuff that she shouldn't have done. So he had some rules for her that she was going to have to obey for the summer. She didn't like those rules. You're going to learn, you're going to hear from family members that Alyssa was a free spirit. She uh, liked to have fun. She liked to party. Um, she would drink. She would occasionally use drugs. She would smoke marijuana. Some people say she would even smoke it daily. She would smoke it on the way to school. Now, these rules were set because of that. She wasn't happy. She did not want to live under these rules. She believed that she was 17. She could do what she wanted. And Mr. Turney said, my house, my rules. And so she stormed off into her bedroom to, after the argument, and that was the last time that Michael Turney ever saw his daughter, Alyssa. Now, you will hear that he went and picked up Sarah from her friend's house. There is some confusion on when that was. Some people will testify that maybe that was 3, 4.30. There's some phone records that might suggest that some of these calls happen between 5.30 and 6 o'clock, but it's between that time. They get back to the house. She's not there. 
starts to panic. You can hear evidence that Michael called her boyfriend. He called her friends. He called family. He went to her work. He went to places where he might be able to find her. He called her cell phone. That's when they found the cell phone. Either uh, Michael or Sarah found that cell phone in her room somewhere. Um, when they called it, they could hear it vibrating. That's how they knew that she didn't have her phone. He even called PPD, Phoenix Police Department. He called. He was imploring them to come take a report. He was talking to an aide. And it wasn't for a couple days that um, a Detective Schoenfelder finally made contact um, with the Turney family. Again, that first night, Michael was up calling people, calling friends, calling family. That happened the next day. He was doing the same thing. He was driving around. You're going to hear from Sarah. You're going to hear from Ms. Masterson.